for our OCLC colleagues who came from even from Germany and France, Spain, Italy. So really nice to have you all here. Um, I will introduce the theme. Um, and we've had some... So we had also uh, we are recording the presentations um, so that after the session, if you go home, you can uh, listen to it again, and other people can also enjoy um, the presentations. So first, let me introduce um, uh, OCLC Research. Uh, many of you know, of course, OCLC Research, but maybe some of you don't know exactly what we are doing. Um, so there is within OCLC a membership and research division and um, within research we um, we do research for the library community around the world um, it's research and development we also have uh, a network which is called the research library partnership and this is the network where research libraries and university libraries can collaborate with each other and with OCLC research on innovative practices and challenges that they are uh, facing. And then we also have a program which is called Web Junction, and that is a lifelong learning program for library professionals. So that is in a nutshell um, what we offer as OCLC research to the community. And then we also have, of course, um, OCLC membership which is also part of our division um, and um, it's a worldwide membership as you can see here we are divided in the which europe middle east and africa and um, asia pacific which also um, uh, includes australia and new zealand um, so uh, each region has representatives from the library membership. Um, we call them delegates, and they are um, working in regional councils. And they very much guide and inform our work at OCLC. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this because, wait, sometimes, yeah. Because actually the whole theme of open open content and open access is a theme that came from our delegates, from our global council de delegates, who each year decide on a topic that they think um, is really important to libraries at, in that specific um, uh, time. It's a topical theme. Um, and open access uh, is, of course, something that is really um, uh, gaining momentum, so uh, especially in uh, in the in in Europe, um, is very important, becoming very important. It was also something that came from the European Council uh, delegates. So, um, I was involved as research uh, staff to help membership and uh, global council to to open the conversation or to start a conversation about open access and open content. And we did a survey and I'm going to give you some results of the survey. I'm going to talk about the survey as an introduction to the theme. And so here are our um, Global Council delegates who were on the program committee with whom we devised and developed the survey. And so we first discussed open access is maybe a little bit too narrow a definition. Uh, we wanted to broaden it to open content because not all libraries in all the regions of the world have the same, um, uh, the same challenges with open access. Um, and open content is much broader. It's not just um, scientific publications necessarily. Uh, it can be also digitized collections, for example. It can be research data sets. It could be um, any freely available resource on the web that is interesting to, uh, to provide access to. And um, that is of interest to not just research libraries, but all types of libraries. And um, indeed, we wanted to be inclusive with um, all types and sizes of libraries across the globe because that is our membership. So our survey, in fact, was not just about open access, but it was really uh, quite broad. It was about the full range of freely available online content. 
And the purpose was really not um, a scientific survey in the sense of, uh, of how we understand how a survey should be uh, uh, happening. Um, it's not a, a quantitative um, measuring of anything. The purpose was really to start that conversation and to involve libraries around the world in that conversation. And um, so we tried also to align um, library terminology about open content. You know, when when you when you have all your services, when you look at your services within your own library, how would you define your open content services? Um, and so that that was an interesting conversation that we had, and we wanted to make sure that libraries across the world would understand what we mean by these activities, and that they would um, start using maybe that terminology as well. So we wanted to provide a framework. Another aim, uh, goal was to explore in how far libraries are able to um, qu quantify their investment in open content. So um, how much budget do they have for open content activities? How much budget do they have for um, Op not only open access uh, licenses or whatever, but um, all their activities, it's, it's FTEs and it's budget and it's project money, or maybe it's not, nothing, maybe there is no source of investment. So these are the 14 categories of open content services that we defined. Um, and I don't know if you can read it in the back of the room, but um, you can see reading it, that uh, it's quite broad, again. Uh, it encompasses all the activities of a library, basically, from acquisition to, um, to cataloging and to uh, uh, preservation, discovery. So it's all these services. And of course, a national library will look differently at these categories than a public library or a, a research library. Um, for example, data services is number five here, and that would be typically for a national library. It would be maybe making its uh, bibliographic data um, available as linked data, for example. That would be data services. But for a research library, that would be more research data management type of activity. So we collected data between November and uh, January. We had 705 respondents from 82 countries, which is really quite a lot. Um, and um, of course, the pool of respondents was self-select. So they chose themselves to react to the survey invitation. And um, because uh, they come from so many different countries, we had a lot of responses, only one response for one country. So there is, of course, um, it is difficult uh, from a pure scientific point of view to make any um, uh, uh, statements around this survey. And you should really listen to these respondents more as individual voices than as you know, a group of homogeneous, balanced uh, representatives of libraries. But still, the data is rich, and um, we are able to do interesting things with it. Um, first of all, I should say two, there are two big imbalances, and one is that most of the respondents, 49%, um, came from the Americas region. So um, there is a bias, of course, here with the data. If you look at it as, the, as a total, then there is a bias towards the Americas. There's also a bias towards research libraries um, because 72% of the respondents were from uh, university libraries and research libraries. And the other categories are uh, not so well represented. So these are the total, uh, the findings of the total respondents, and I'm not going to give you any detailed information here on this because, first of all, it's probably not even readable for you. 
Um, but we're going to, um, to publish this. So if you're really interested in the data, and it is interesting data, um, I would encourage you to, to look at what we are going to publish about this. Um, but just very broadly, what I would like to say with this slide is that most libraries are involved, indicate that they are involved in open content activities. And in most of these 14 activities that we offer them to choose from as well. So um, there is a lot of activity going on within libraries of all sorts and in all regions around open content, much more than we had thought there would be. There's also um, great investment in it. Um, although libraries have difficulty to, um, to be able to say, I'm, I'm, I'm investing so much of my budget in open content, I'm investing so much in paid content because that's difficult to uh, to distinguish because that's not the way they budget uh, the planning um, but um, nevertheless they were able to say um, not how much percent but they were able to say that for each of these activities how much is um, covered by budget line items how much is covered by FTE allocations and, pro and project money. So there is a lot of data out there. They are also assessing their um, services. So they are able to say if they are very successful or somewhat successful or not successful, which is also great news. And um, so there are also some regional differences. But again, I'm not going to go into these details now for this session. Because, because of the richness of the data, we need also to scope and to, um, to have an interpretative framework. So scoping to universities and research libraries is an obvious choice because that's where most of the respondents come from. And you can see here that then the top activity within university libraries is the institutional repository, which is probably not a big surprise to most of you. And then comes supporting users and instruction, and then promoting the discovery of open content. Um, there is a difference. In the Americas, in the United States in particular, uh, promoting the discovery of open content would be top one. And in uh, Europe and uh, Asia Pacific, it would be the institutional repository would be top one. So there are some regional differences here. I would like to offer you a framework to analyze the data. And this is a framework that, um, that comes from Lorcan Dempsey's um, uh, thought, uh, thinking about uh, collections. And he talks about three trends in library collections. Um, one is the inside out collection. The other is the facilitated collection. And the third is the collective collection. I don't know in how far this terminology is well known, um, but I will give a short definition of each. So the inside out collection is really the trend within university libraries and research libraries that um, more and more effort is going into um, supporting researchers locally at the own institution, the parent institution, to publish. Uh, they support, libraries support researchers and students to, to do their research, uh, uh, to deposit their research outputs, whether they are data sets or publications or preprints or whatever, software. Um, and they, um, they facilitate all these activities. And in that way, they are developing an inside-out collection, a collection that, that is born inside the institution and that they then make discoverable to the rest of the world. And that is in contrast to the outside-in collection, which used to be the way libraries collected, and that is collecting what is being published out there for the users within the institution. That is the outside-in. The facilitated collection is really, um, I realize that I'm talking, but you're not even, 
uh, hearing my uh, the amplifier, I think. Um, I really have to talk into the... <laughs> okay. Um, so the facilitated collection is more about um, resources, uh, information resources that are not in the library, that are not part of the collection of the library, um, but that are, that they are facilitated by the library to give access to, to your own research community. And then thirdly, the collective collection. That is the collection that um, libraries collectively have and manage and care for and steward and curate and so forth. And typically that is the print collection. That's also where typically libraries cooperate most around print collections with interlibrary loan, with shared cataloging, with all the traditional shared um, activities around print collections but also increasingly um, digitized print collections. I mean, print collections that are digitized. And these digitized collections, again, are, um, can be seen as collective collections of libraries um, around which their um, uh, uh, new workflows are created and uh, needs uh, that, are, that are similar for all libraries where sharing uh, workflows and sharing and being more efficient about it is possible. Okay. I hope that it's clear enough now, the difference. So now looking at the, uh, the data of the, the survey with that lens of the, um, and I have here the facilitate, but it should be the inside out collection. This is the lens, looking at the data with the lens of the inside out collection. So it's really research support. And we see that the institutional repository, support of authors and producers within the university, and publishing open content and RDM services, are um, all four of them are activities that are um, quite, quite successful, um, quite well resourced, um, and um, the libraries say that the right scale for them is uh, to achieve impact is the local scale, is institutional scale. Um, data services is probably less successful, um, but it's clear that libraries uh, significantly want to accelerate those services. Those services are the, at the top priority. And again, this is not news, I think, for, for us. Uh, we knew this, but it's nice to see that the data is actually is actually confirming what we already see as a trend. Then we have the facilitated collection, and here um, that is supporting users to find open content, that is selecting open content not managed by my library, and that is promoting the discovery of open content. And here what is interesting to see is that Selecting open content not managed by my library is the least resourced, is the near least successful, and has the lowest score for acceleration. So it seems that libraries are becoming less interested in selecting open content that is not managed by them. Uh, but on the other hand, promoting the discovery of open content is important to them. Um, even if it is not so well resourced and not so successful, they do want to accelerate. Thirdly, the collective collection. Um, and this is really about the theme of today. So um, this is about digitizing your collections. It's about digital libraries as systems where you keep those digitized collections where you manage them, where you curate them, where you make them discoverable, um, and the deep interactions with open content. Um, and here you see that the first two, digitizing and keeping those digital libraries, are quite successful, and that libraries want to accelerate. Um, deep interactions is the least mature. It's, quite, it's an activity that is uh, quite new. Um, not yet so successful, but most planned, it's one 
of the activities that libraries say they really want to start doing next year or in two years, and they want to accelerate. And they also expect help from OCLC in that area, which is interesting. Okay, so that has introduced the theme of today, which is about discovery and use of open digitized collections. And um, so the shift to open has led to uh, digitizing a lot of uh, analog materials and making them open by uh, managing the, the rights, the rights issue, and freeing that, making it public domain, um, and leading to a lot of content that is freely available for reuse. But what is made open is not automatically accessible. And that is something that we are, it's becoming more and more clear that that is becoming an issue and a challenge. So um, the impact of having open collections is only um, doable, achievable, if uh, you, uh, you accelerate also the visibility, you increase the visibility and the findability. So that's where we are going to talk about triple, triple IF, um, about um, for example, also making your collections more visible through Wikimedia projects, uh, registries, and so on. So there are plenty of initiatives in this area which are interesting to follow. And well, this is an example of from our international link data survey um, of uh, how libraries are publishing uh, their data as link data in which areas. And um, you find that digital collections is not the, the largest area. Obviously, for libraries, bibliographic data and descriptive metadata will score higher. But still, digital collections is there. It's there, and it's growing. Um, supporting digital scholarship with reuse, that is what we call deep interactions with the content. And um, in yet another survey that we did, that was a survey on research library innovations, um, support for digital scholarship and digital humanity scored as follows. In, you know, the question was, what are the top most challenging and ripe for innovation activities? And these are the answers from Canada. It was the first top most um, challenging innovation um, with 64%. In Australia, New Zealand, it was second. In the UK, it was second. In Europe, it was third. So um, all of them in the top three, together with other challenges like RDM. Typically, RDM was also one of the top three challenges. So there is the program for today. Uh, so first, we'll talk about prom promoting the discovery of open collections. And uh, Shane, um, my colleague from OCLC, uh, will, will uh, tell us about developments with the Content DM product development. Antoine Isaac will uh, talk about the developments at Europeana. And Paul Gooding um, on the Global Digitized Dataset Network. And then after a short break, uh, we'll talk about deep interactions with open collections. Um, and our experiences at the CATFIS uh, project that uh, OCLC is doing together with uh, the TU Eindhoven and uh, University of Amsterdam. So, and then we'll have uh, uh, lunch. And uh, during the session, uh, please feel free to stand up and take a drink. Uh, behind, in the corner, there's also a fridge with uh, some juices and tomato juice and apple juice and so on. So if you'd like to have something else than water and tea, you are uh, free and welcome to take some there. So um, Shane, can I ask you to uh, take over? And please, um, can you introduce yourself very shortly? Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Shane Huddleston. Uh, I'm with OCLC. I work in the Seattle office. Uh, I'm out in Leiden for the week, uh, meeting with colleagues. And it's good to see all of you here today. It's a pretty good, uh, pretty good crowd. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm the product manager for Content DM. Uh, I'm going to talk about a project we've been working on uh, to aggregate Content DM metadata and basically try to do more with it. Uh, so I've got some details to share there. There we go. So you'll see two other names on here. Um, Jeff Mixter and Bruce Washburn uh, work in OCLC research. Uh, I work very closely with them. They are the ones who probably did most of the work here that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but we have a very close collaboration uh, between Content DM, the product, the service of OCLC, and uh, the research division of OCLC. So very quickly, what is Content DM for those who don't know? Uh, OCLC's cloud-based digital repository service. Um, we have probably around 2,600 libraries worldwide that use Content DM today. There are roughly 65 million digital objects in all encompassing in all of those uh, sites together. As you might imagine, it's a lot of different sites, a lot of different descriptive standards. There is an immense diversity of approaches to metadata and categorization and content DM. Uh, it's today, it's basically very site specific. So each institution thinks of their repository as their own. So there's really no, very little standardization across all of those sites together. We also, uh, Probably 18, a couple years ago, we added support for the IIIF image and presentation APIs to Content DM. And so that was kind of an initial, initial step that's led us to uh, start to do more. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. What is IIIF? So I'll, I'll go through this relatively quickly. If you haven't heard of IIIF before, it is the International Image Interoperability Framework. Uh, it's, it's a community-focused and growing um, effort. The goal, uh, mostly, like a lot of what IIIF does is defines APIs for access to digital content. It's much more than that, but um, if you think most concretely about what, what IIIF does, it's the creation of these APIs to promote access to digital material. In addition to that, it encourages application development. So having an API is great, but what can you do with it? So there's a, a lot of sort of fermentation of viewers and experimentation and innovation uh, in terms of the presentation, you know, building exhibits and things like that from this, the digital content. I, I think a key point about IIIF is it really tries to focus on real world use cases. So it's not a sort of let's build a standard just for a standard's sake. Can somebody demonstrate a real use for IIIF? Then we will try to include it in the standards. The other thing is it, it tries to promote developer happiness. If you're going to build an API, you want it to be usable. You want uh, developers to uh, have as little friction as possible. So there is a significant focus on making sure it's, it can be turned into something that works fairly easily. And then just overall, IIIF supports uh, scholarship and research in the digital humanities and special collections and cultural heritage uh, section. So that's really sort of the focus of the community today. So what about those APIs? So there are several APIs that have been defined in IIIF. There is an image API, which you can use to get basic information about an image. How large is it? Um, how, what, what zoom levels are supported? Uh, that, that's like a JSON response to just get those details. And then, of course, you can get the image. So if you uh, want to get the entire image, a low res image, a thumbnail sized image, a, a very deep uh, high resolution image, or even just segments of the image. You can do uh, tiles from within the image. All of that is supported with the API. So it works very well in any UI that you want to build. Uh, you can uh, select whatever, whatever image you need fit for purpose for your UI. 
Then, of course, you have to know something about the record. An image in a vacuum isn't very helpful. So there's a presentation API, which defines some structural information uh, about, uh, about the record. If it's a, si a simple image, maybe there's not a whole lot to describe there. Uh, there will be some minimal metadata included so that you, you want to have a title. You want to have something to put into your UI. Um, you can also use the presentation API to describe complex documents, like multi-page materials. So you can have all of that structural information. There's a search API. This is focused only on if you want to search within a record. You've already found the record, so this isn't a universal search across a repository or search across the internet. It's just uh, searching within and finding you know, bounding boxes around search terms within the image, et cetera. There's an authentication API. This is a fairly lightweight API. It's really just, it's not trying to solve the problem of authentication per se, but it's just letting your IIIF based resource interact with whatever authentication scheme you've defined. So if you do have protected materials in some way, there is a provision for that within the realm of IIIF. So that was all basically just background. Um, it's this bottom one. The change discovery API is not final. The, these four above are, are at the 1.0 or higher level. So they're considered production ready. This change discovery API is new. It's, uh, it's being worked on. It's in development. So it's not finalized yet. Um, but it's a very interesting API in terms of starting to starting to uh, tackle the use cases of how to understand more about an entire repository or an entire collection. So that's the one I'm going to talk in, in more detail today about. So when we started this project, we had uh, easy access to all of this content DM material, and we wanted to see what we could do with it. So we started with five hypotheses. We wanted to know if we could use W3C activity streams to, uh, to sit on top of content DM materials. We wanted to know if we used an API uh, and connected with activity streams, can that help, can that be used to make those materials more accessible? We wanted to look at how, once you've gotten that data, data from the API, uh, what, what can you do with it? How, how can you use it? How can you crawl it and make it, uh, make it more functional? And then the theme today is how can we improve discovery? How can it, how can it help us learn more about what we already have or just find it? And then lastly, uh, can we derive structured linked data? I didn't mention that ContentDM today is, all the metadata is text-based. There's no, there's no identifiers uh, in there. There's no uh, entities. It's all just text. So we wanted to know if we could convert that to linked data, basically. So I'll go into these in a little more detail. Um, so can we create activity streams from ContentDM data? Activity streams are a, uh, it's basically a, a, a API for defining a feed of information. So if you uh, think of it like a Facebook or Twitter, if you have a, a feed, you want to know what's new, what's different, who deleted that comment. Uh, you, need to, you need to know something about it. So it's really just a sort of chronological feed that tells you the activity that has transpired in whatever system you're looking at. So this wasn't something that was built into ContentDM, so we had to figure out how, what would it look like to add it. So uh, for this project, it's sort of in a pilot phase, we just did it manually. So we looked at uh, all the data across the entire system and built the necessary data structures to produce an activity stream feed approach. It was a manual process. Um, and uh, to, right now, the, it's semi-automated, and we sort of update it monthly. So it's not a true activity stream in the sense of it's real time, uh, but it's good enough for this pilot uh, work. However, it's good to note um, only image records are represented. This is uh, because we're working with the uh, IIIF image API. We're only looking at image materials. So ContentDM has many more material types in it. Um, PDFs are not encompassed by this, audio, video, etc. yet. So we're looking only at images today. 
Um, we also had to supplement it. Um, so there are some crucial pieces of information that were not built into the record structure concept in ContentDM automatically. And so we had to, things like, who is the institution who owns it? Who, uh, what's, what's some basic description of this collection? So that material we had to basically assemble. We had to pull that from other sources to put it into the feed. So this is really just speaking to sort of the, the things we have to look to in the future if we wanted to make this into a production service. But so we had to do some, some work, manual workarounds for now. So uh, that basically worked though. So true, we can do that. So then let's formalize it a little bit more and let's look at the IIIF API. So this uh, change discovery API, it's, it's uh, under development now, I think it's at version 0 0.3, it's in its third iteration. Um, and if you think of the, the change discovery API, it really is similar to OAI PMH, if you're, if you're familiar with that, um, uh, similar to, to resource sync. It's just a way to, to know what is in a system and to know about its activity. Um, it's, it's a JSON response and it's, uh, you know, it's segmented, it's, it's designed for machine processing. So you grab, you grab one, one chunk and you get the next one and you can, you can scour an entire huge repository through that sort of iteration approach. Um, so we built it. We built it to the IIIF spec, um, the evolving spec. We learned some things along the way. We're also we're, we're working in tandem with the IIIF community. So we're also testing, testing the specification and making sure that it makes sense and it scales. Um, However, it's just a pilot today, so it hasn't really been exercised. It hasn't, it hasn't seen a lot of traffic, so that's something that we'll be following closely uh, as we go. Um, and then it's, it's a pilot, and so it, it's not a production service. It, it's, a, it's a couple developers in OCLC Research who are running this system today, so it's not a, it's not a full on um, service yet. So then, what can we do with the API? How can we use it to uh, crawl a, an entire set of repositories? So IIIF as part of the change discovery API outlines that crawling mechanism. So how do, how do I uh, go through an entire feed and assemble all of those materials? We did that. And we used that approach to harvest a total of about 13 million records. So that's, uh, it's a lot. Uh, it's basically all of the images in a content DM repository today. So that worked well. Um, again, this is the, these are the sort of, it's not production caveats. Uh, it's the harvesting rate is limited, rate limited for um, uh, just to prevent a, a potential abuse. Uh, and we also found some issues along the way. Once you start aggregating material like that, you, the the problems uh, stick right out. So we found we actually discovered some flaws in Content DM's IIIF implementation, which was great. We were able to uh, find those and, and fix those. Um, so how can Content DM discovery be improved? So we aggregated all of those materials together. Once we had that feed of uh, 13 million records, uh, we built an index from that, and you can start to see a lot when you look at that much diverse material all at once. So it was very interesting. Um, we created an interface for sort of a single search across all of those materials. Uh, and you start to see some very interesting patterns. You see material that's not where you would expect it to be. Uh, collections, collections that are uh, about maybe some region specific uh, historical event, but are held by an institution halfway across the world from where that, where that event took place. So you start to see some really interesting um, discovery, sort of serendipitous discovery once you look across that system. So some of the problems, um, inconsistency in how these materials are described. So sometimes people are, the metadata relates to the digitized material. Sometimes it relates to the physical, the original material. That's not always clear from how, how it was described, how it was cataloged. Um, and the, I think the, the excellent sort of discovery experiences in Europeana and in DPLA in the US have shaped 
uh, sort of uh, promoted a, a, a higher standard for discovery. So we are starting in this initial phase, we're starting to see those benefits, but there's more. There's more that needs to be done to really realize uh, the full potential there. So then lastly, structured linked data, uh, can we derive that from, from text-based content DM data once it's been aggregated? Um, we did, we worked through a Dublin core mapping uh, sort of process to get a little bit closer. Um, uh, fields in content DM can be mapped to any Dublin core element. So that uh, basically was included. We got that uh, already just by the fact that it was in, from content DM. And we looked at some specific fields to see what uh, sense we could make of all of that material. So as I, where I started with this, the, uh, the way materials are described in content DM is hugely inconsistent. So it's, um, there's, no one, there's no one thing that's going to work. Uh, that's just a given. Um, any sort of automation is really dependent on the source quality, and it varies a lot. So sometimes it works pretty well, other times not, not so well. So it's a, it's a pretty up and down um, experience. Um, the other thing we found is making sense of the data is pretty hard to do after the fact. So if you're just looking at it in an aggregated sense, you're not always clear why did they, why is this value appearing in this field? I don't, I don't get it. But if you could get back to the person who cataloged it, to, to the original uh, domain expert, you could answer that question and it wouldn't be that hard to answer it. So I'll, I'm going to run through just a couple specific examples here. Um, so we wanted to, we wanted to derive linked data from this text-based metadata. So we started, we just started to do some text matching, uh, is basically the process. So we looked at some specific fields, um, and started with the Dublin core, uh, field type, field element, and then we looked for matches. Uh, so we looked at Library of Congress TGM, we looked at Getty AAT, and you can see you know, you look for the word negatives and, and you match it. You look for drawings and you match it. So some of this was, it was actually pretty quick. It wasn't that hard to do this when you, uh, if you're a human. You know, if you just look at it, you can start to make sense of it pretty quickly. And so there are some definite easy wins from this process. Another example, uh, this is sort of a, this is a, a, a different field looking at the audience field. Um, some of these, you know, it starts to get, you, you kind of have to bring some knowledge to what, you have to read the words and understand what they are to start to, to match them. Uh, you're not just doing a strict, uh, does the word exist in both vocabularies? So there's another layer here of understanding what the word means and matching it. Uh, so we did that process as well. We did some of this sort of manual review through the metadata in bulk. Um, dates is another good example. It's not always very tightly controlled, but you can often look at it and know what they meant. Um, so there's sort of a series of processes we went through field by field to, to do a quick level of improvement. Hello. So this is a screenshot. It, we wanted to build something that you could look at from all of this material. So this is a screenshot of the uh, Explorer API that we built. And this is a little small, but um, up there at the top, you can see there's about 49,000 results. So this was after doing these improvement processes and uh, mapping text strings to linked data entities, this is a search for um, letters, letters and documents. And so we were able to pull up 50,000 letters and documents from that 13 million materials. I'm sure there's, more, there's much more that can be done. There are, there's more reconciliation that could happen to improve that further. But we were quite pleased that we were able to get a set of 40, 49,000 materials that quickly. And then the other thing that's nice is using all of these, the IIIF APIs, it was quite simple to build a visual API. And that lets you kind of skim through and scroll through and it's like, yeah, these all look like letters. These do look to me like, so I think we're right. So you have this kind of quick visual check to confirm that your process was right, that you actually matched the metadata correctly. So I think this is one of the, the big wins and benefits of something like IIIF. We didn't have to spend a lot of time building a UI. 
the, the APIs are already there. Once we started, once we committed to using the APIs, throwing it all into a U, UI was really quite simple. So we were, the, the key point there is we were able to focus on the, the research topics, less on the just doing web development. Um, this is kind of another example um, of just the problem areas. I mean, anyone who's familiar with digital collections, there are so many potential problem areas. Um, this, this is one where there are two, two buildings on the same postcard. How do you, how do you, how do you map the, the geo coordinates of those two things in different places? So the digital material is a thing in itself, but then it refers to physical things in another location. So there's, these are the kinds of quandaries that have to be solved on some level uh, to, to truly make really good sense of all of the, um, the variety of digital materials today that you'll find. I think this is my last example. Um, this, is a, this is a good case for the way people describe materials varies a lot. And sometimes they, they do things like separate out subcomponents of addresses. Well, one, once, you, once you separate that all out, you've lost, you've lost the context. Um, you, know, you know that it maps to spatial, but where is this city? You know, the, what, which, which Springfield is this? Springfield is, I think, the most common city name in the United States. There, it could be anywhere. So if, once you isolate it that, down to that level, you've lost, you've lost the really critical information. So there are some specific areas that need a little more attention in terms of treating sets of fields, groups of fields, to have the full context. So what did we learn from this? Um, we did learn that at activity screens and the change discovery API works. We were able to build all this. It really wasn't that hard. Uh, it didn't take that much time to do this. Uh, and we were able to process through 13 million records uh, pretty uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, aggregation definitely adds value. There's so much more value we know we can add uh, in the future, but we already were starting to see these patterns, see ways to improve metadata in a, in a bulk way uh, pretty quickly. Uh, structured data can be reconciled from text. It's certainly effort is involved. Uh, it's not free, uh, but it uh, can be done. And there's, as I, I like to look at it as there's, there's many layers. It just depends how much time you want to put into it. So you can get some very quick wins quite easily. And then it, you know, you, your wins take more effort as you go. Um, we definitely learned that content DM data is, just so diverse, you cannot, it's impossible to do the full reconciliation process at the end of the line, after aggregating the material, after mapping it to Dublin Core. You've lost too much information by that point. So we have to do something upstream, closer to the originator of the record, the person who described it first, has to start to become involved to get the full extent of uh, reconciliation to happen. Um, and the discovery experience for sure is uh, much better. If, if we can get those uh, reconciled structured um, entities out of uh, all of the repositories together, we can have a much better discovery ex experience for the end user. And then I'll just end on sort of where we're, where we're going from here. Um, so I think we're quite happy with this, with the progress we've made, uh, and it's inspired us to take it further. So what we're gonna be looking at is we wanna continue to expand support and content DM for the IIIF APIs. They're very useful tools. Um, we can do a lot with them. So that is a strong commitment we have just within OCLC. Um, we, really need to look at what do reconciliation tools look like? So if we're gonna give users, system users of Content DM these tools to uh, reconcile their own metadata, what do those tools look like? How much do we have to build? How much is already available? So that's sort of the phase we're looking at now. Um, and then we, we need to give it a try. So we need to start working with users who have the domain expertise, who understand their material, who know why they described it in that way, and, and sort of observe them 
doing the reconciliation. Observe their challenges, which of those problems can we solve, and uh, which, which things are, are pretty easy. So we're always looking for how we can uh, at least get some benefit uh, pr pretty quickly out of it. And then just, you know, it's a negotiation to, say, to decide how much more time to spend to see those benefits. Um, and that's basically it. That's what we've done. Yeah, I think you're up. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll start here. Thank you. OK, hi, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Antoine Isaac from Europeana. Uh, I would like to, uh, to thank you, to, especially Tissia, for the, uh, the invitation to, uh, to be here. It's, uh, it's really a great opportunity for, uh, for us to, uh, to present our, our work with IIIF. Uh, and there's actually a lot of, uh, of connections with what, uh, what OCLC is doing. Uh, actually, probably, yeah, if I would want to talk about just the connections, I would have not enough time uh, in this talk. So please, Ticia, just rush me if I'm, uh, if I'm taking too much time. Uh, so I, yeah, so I work as R&D manager. So uh, my area is uh, mostly about uh, data modeling, data enrichment, uh, discovery. Uh, so that's a very small part of what uh, what Europeana does, uh, and this, in this talk I'm, I'm going to be a bit uh, a bit more general because well, obviously that's going to be uh, to be uh, to be useful for for setting the scene. And actually, we do a lot of relevant stuff with respect to IIIF that's not done by by my team. Yeah, uh, what is Europeana? So. Uh, fairly basic backgrounds, uh, hopefully uh, most of you know. Uh, I'm nonetheless going to go through again because some of that is relevant for, uh, uh, for IIIF. And actually, some of the very specific characteristics of Europeana uh, are key uh, for understanding our interest in, in the IIIF technology. Uh, so we are a non-profit foundation, uh, but we are also a community of 2,400 uh, experts in digital heritage, so our European network, and we have a shared mission uh, that's worded uh, quite uh, ambitiously about transforming the world with culture, uh, making it easier for people to use uh, cultural heritage, uh, contribute to an open, knowledgeable, and creative society. So we see open here, uh, so stuff that uh, Tissia has mentioned. So uh, we are an open data platform, actually, that provides several services. Uh, so there are APIs that provide the, the data. And uh, there's, uh, there's a portal at europeana.eu uh, that allows everyone to, to discover and browse uh, the stuff. Uh, we provide access to over 58 million objects uh, from, uh, from over 3,500 uh, museums, libraries, and archives in Europe. Uh, and sometimes actually a bit uh, a bit elsewhere, uh, and we are committed to to sharing uh, to sharing that stuff. Uh, actually, uh, in the past days, I think uh, some kind of agreement has been made with OCLC so that some of our data would reach you uh, in some ways. Uh, so uh, more to follow. <clears throat> Uh, so this is what it looks like on the uh, the homepage. So it's possible to search and find stuff. Uh, and now I'm going to dive a bit into the technical detail because that, that's really key for understanding why we are interested in IIIF. So what's inside Europeana? So what we get for all our partners, so the museums, archives, uh, libraries, is mostly metadata. So descriptive metadata, technical metadata. Uh, they also send us thumbnails. But as a rule, we don't have the digitized content ourselves. Well, there are a few exceptions, and I'm going to, to come back to this a bit, a bit later, especially for, uh, for a newspapers collection that we have. But the rule for Europeana is that the content is still served on our partners' website. Uh, and that has really some, uh, some big consequences. So this is uh, a diagram that also shows how the data flows uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the European network. So we've got memory institutions that contribute data to some organizations and projects that we call aggregators. So we don't interact directly uh, with, uh, with every uh, individual institution in our network. There are some, some intermediaries. And the metadata flows then uh, up, to, uh, up to us in this, uh, in this diagram. 
So why does Europeana support AAAF? Why are we interested in that? Well, we believe it can help us fulfill our mission. So at the strategy uh, level, uh, there is a big uh, match uh, between what AAAF wants to encourage and what Europeana wants to encourage. So keyword like using, uh, using stuff, learning, uh, enjoying, being open, uh, sharing knowledge, and being creative. I mean, all these things are more or less already mentioned in, uh, in the previous presentation. Uh, we believe that IIIF can allow us to better answer our user needs, uh, and we believe that it can also help our partner fulfill their own mission. Uh, so while well, doing good stuff with the, the content, uh, the cultural content is not only something for Europeana. Uh, every organization in our network has this shared goal. And what does Europeana, uh, what does AAAF bring, bring to us in this, uh, this context? Uh, so it does allow to access content in a standardized way. So this is the stuff that Shane has alluded to in the, in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, presentation. It's a standard set of API. It's easy to use. Uh, it also promotes an open, uh, an open access approach. So it's, it's not mandatory that every AAAF resource would be fully open. Actually, it's possible to serve AAAF resource behind a paywall if, uh, if one would fancy this. But still, the message in the community, the message uh, by the very design of the technology is that it brings a lot of value when the content is, uh, is more open. And of course, that matches our, our goals. Uh, the content owners, they keep serving the content. So AAAF allows to access the content without passing files around. Uh, and that's really important. So I've, I've mentioned earlier that Europeana does not aim to get the digitized content. So AAAF really fits that, that setting where, mm -hmm. uh, where the content resides on, a, on a, the institution side and then it can be accessed uh, on, uh, on another service. And that, that enables better control, better provenance, uh, better attribution also, uh, and of course, better visibility, because it's just way easier uh, to allow accessing the content in, uh, in more spaces. So it's good for providers, and it's good for reusers. And actually, in that, uh, in that part of the presentation, I conceive Europeana as a data user. So providers, Europeana partners provide some content, and we, we reuse it the same way as, uh, I don't know, a researcher could use it, for example. It's just that we are a specific instance of AAAF uh, reuse. Well, we do actually uh, do a bit more of this. But, uh, AAAF is also a community, and here I'm going to extend a bit on what Shane uh, presented uh, earlier. Uh, so AAAF is a community, and that's basically organized in, uh, in two levels. So the first one is a consortium. Uh, of paying members, and that's all, over 50 institutions that basically allow uh, the AAAF community to, uh, to exist by providing the means to, well, to do plenty of things like events, uh, to organize the technical infrastructure for the website and that sort of thing. Uh, both of CLC and Europeana are members of the consortium, by the way. Uh, but beyond the consortium, there's a community which is uh, way bigger. Uh, and uh, also very diverse. The, the very good thing with the AAAF community is that there are people with, uh, with very varied uh, technical background, with very varied uh, jobs within their organizations. And that's really uh, interesting for, well, setting a vision, so to say, and implementing it in a way that, that's really feasible. So there are many details about what the co how the community is organized. So there are some groups which are standing. There are some groups which are thematic. I'm not going to go through all this. You can uh, you can check the slides uh, later. Later, but what's interesting is that there are some groups which are devoted to discussing some some specific aspects, and that's fairly good because then the people who join the community they. Uh, they can join the parts that are mostly uh, interested for, for them. So if I want to talk to OCLC about discovery, I know that we, I will go to the technical specification group on discovery, and then we can have some, uh, some very good discussions. If I'm interested in serving newspapers content, and that's going to be a, a part in, uh, in my, my presentation, there's a newspapers community group which provides uh, a discussion area for sharing best practices on how to represent and exchange newspapers content. 
That community is very active. Uh, it's very open. It shares interests with Europeana. That's, that's very good for us. Uh, and they don't only discuss image services. So IIIF uh, has image in the, uh, in the name, but it, it actually goes beyond that. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about annotations, about discovery. Uh, Shane just presented that. Uh, about handling specific content, uh, about applying linked data in a meaningful way. Uh, so it's really a good place, actually. So what do we do uh, with AAAF at Europeana concretely? Uh, so I've said that uh, Europeana is mostly based on metadata. So what we do concretely with AAAF should be based on metadata. So uh, for aggregating the metadata from all our providers, we have a data model, uh, which is uh, not so originally called the Europeana data model. Uh, so we wanted to be able to recognize triple AF content in what we get from our partners. So we started with extending our data model so that there's a little flag somewhere that says, hey, this is a piece of triple AF content. And then our providers can use that flag to say, hey, I've got triple AF content. Please treat it as triple AF content. Uh, so very, uh, uh, a very first basic step. But already at this stage, uh, the power of the Tree for Life community showed up because, uh, well, you can't see this very, uh, very fancy drawing, but that's actually that was made uh, during the Triple AF conference where uh, we came with a proposal for a data model saying, hey, this is how we think we should connect to Triple AF content in a linked data model like ours. And we had a couple of hours of discussion around, uh, around some beers and we finalized our model this way. Uh, and that just felt easy. Uh, so once we are equipped with our data model extension, our providers can start flagging this AAAF content. And I've got a list here uh, of, uh, of the, the collections that we receive already as AAAF. Uh, so there's a, there's a bunch of, uh, of partners. It is, uh, it is growing. Uh, actually, we hope that uh, in some months we will get some more even from OCLC. So there are some discussions with I don't remember the name of that organization in Catalonia, but uh, we are hopeful. And uh, ah, this thing, sorry. So uh, then, once we get the, uh, the the collection, we can we can view it in uh, in Europeana. And actually, because I, I'm wondering at this stage, how many of you have already seen a triple AF image? Okay, so maybe I won't do my demo then if you know what it, uh, what it looks like because demo is a, bit, uh, is a bit risky. Who would like to see that stuff in Europeana? Mm, okay, well, uh, let's try. I'm not promising anything. I may actually just break everything. Yeah, so this is a, a piece uh, of... Uh, parchment uh, that comes from, uh, from Switzerland. And uh, what's interesting is that it's uh, 6.5 meter long. Uh, so it's basically uh, the distance between uh, me and Tisha if I would stand somewhere here. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, and it's, it's visible in Europeana, so I can, I can scroll, uh, I, can, uh, I can zoom zoom in and out. Uh, through the uh, the entire thing, uh, so it's it's quite I mean it's quite a good experience for such a beast of content, uh, and the cool thing is that for us it's completely transparent. It's as easy to handle uh, as uh, as a simple uh, well simple a simple book, uh, and uh, and the provider uh, decides how they, uh, so they still have control over how it's viewed in, in Europeana. So in that specific instance, uh, there's an access. So there's, there's a page that has the, uh, the entire thing. And then they split, uh, so that's the verso. And then they've split, uh, they split it in different pages, uh, which allow a bit better zooming. It's actually, personally, I, I, I'm not sure this was really needed. But somehow, this is the way they wanted users to experience it. And well, we respect that. So they, they kept control over a part of the, the visualization. And that, that costs us nothing, actually, uh, because it, yeah, it's just 
uh, in the data that they serve us, and it's turned out. So for us, handling this is just, uh, the, just the same as handling any other content. And now, ooh, it works. Uh, okay, so, uh, and we plan to extend this, uh, this viewing functionality to audiovisual, so there are plans in the AAAF uh, community to, uh, to, support, uh, to support AV material. Uh, so we are following this quite, uh, quite closely. We also advertise AAAF resource via our APIs. So it's not only for us. Uh, when we know that something is AAAF, our APIs also flag it to our, uh, to our data users. Uh, then I've mentioned uh, newspapers, uh, and I, I think that's also quite an interesting case study of how AAAF can be useful for us. Uh, so in general, we don't have content, except for a couple of things, uh, and that newspapers collection is, uh, is, uh, is one of the big exceptions. Uh, so we've got, uh, we've got millions of newspapers issues that we have to host ourselves as a result of a past project. Some of you in this audience are very familiar with that, uh, Chiara. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting content. Uh, but to handle it, uh, we have well, to do many things, and one of them is to come with a data model uh, for representing the stuff. So we've got the, the issues, we've got the pages, we've got the, the full text content OCR. Uh, and you won't need to understand how we did the modeling. Uh, the important thing for us is that we could do this modeling, or at least refine it, with the help of the AAAF community. We just reuse some best practices, some discussion that were happening in the AAAF and newspapers community group. And this complex modeling example, or, well, it, it became again easier and we felt more, more safe about, about it. And that in terms of, of value, I mean, Europeana is quite a small, uh, a small team and being able to, to get something out of the communities uh, is quite priceless for, for us. So, the community is, is really important for us. So uh, as said, we are a member of the, the AAAF consortium. Uh, we participate in the, 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 the executive committee. Uh, we do a lot of uh, participation at AAAF events. So next week there's a AAAF conference and I'll be there and well, we'll be talking about the same things. Uh, we are involved in some newspapers and discovery group. Actually, I'm, I'm chairing the, the discovery group that, uh, that Shane mentioned and uh, yeah. We, we do things, uh, not only in the AAAF community, also in our own community, uh, where we try to encourage uh, our partners to adopt AAAF uh, by showing them the, the value of that, well, basically presentations, uh, blog posts, things that show a bit the stuff that I've uh, shown you today. How much time do we have, Tizia? Seven minutes. Okay, well, I still have some time to, uh, to talk about uh, R&D in metadata aggregation, some of the more technical stuff, which actually may be quite quick because Shane has already uh, mentioned a lot of it. Uh, so there's one part uh, of the AAAF work that's really interesting for us. It's, uh, it's the work about changing the way one accesses and discover, uh, what, what one finds uh, a, AAAF, uh, a AAAF resource. And basically, that means that uh, there's a potential to change the way Europeana aggregates the metadata. Uh, so our data ingestion is based on uh, OAI PMH, so a fairly old standard, which is showing quite, uh, quite some limits uh, currently. So we want to update it. Uh, we want to seize opportunities that arise from the, uh, from the adoption of IIIF and linked data, especially um, data models like, like schema.org. And basically what we would like to, uh, to do is to, to benefit from technologies that, can, that are a bit more versatile uh, than, than OAI PMH. So OAI PMH is just for metadata aggregations. So it, it works actually rather well for us, but the thing is that it's, it's a lot of effort for our partners and the benefit is just for us. While if they implement a AAAF service. If they implement an data service, the benefits are wider. Uh, so we are more hopeful to get actually better quality data if our partners uh, can do several things uh, with, a simple, with a single technical, uh, technical effort. Uh, 
So we are especially involved in uh, co-developing uh, the AAAF discovery specs uh, for finding and updating AAAF resources and the metadata that, uh, that, goes, uh, that go with them. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, so first, uh, a repetition of what Shane said. So the, the AAAF discovery uh, specification, it's about finding AAAF resources, but because the AAAF resources are also supposed to come with links to metadata to description about uh, about them, that that's where it becomes very interesting for for us because aggregating AAAF resources also gives access to the metadata that we dearly need for enabling our services. Uh, and then I've got a comment uh, on the way the AAAF discovery uh, group works uh, because Shane mentioned that uh, OCLC does uh, does some work uh, about testing the, the the specification, and so do we. But actually, the way it happens in the group is even more interactive. I mean, OCLC does not only test, it's really participating to the development of the spec. So Jeff Mixter, uh, as well as ourselves, when there's something missing in the spec, we say it, and then we discuss about including it in the spec. So that, that's also really great about the AAAF community. There's this content, constant openness uh, about how the specifications should be, uh, what's in there. And as soon as there is a good use case for changing the specification and people uh, listen to us with, uh, with a very open-minded uh, approach. So uh, we have set up uh, what we call a data aggregation lab. And here, that's mostly work from my, uh, my colleague, Nuno Freire, uh, who basically set up a platform, a prototype, uh, to aggregate metadata coming from, from different, uh, different channels. Uh, one of them being the AAAF change discovery specification. So uh, there's a little interface where we can select the channel that we want to, uh, to harvest metadata from. Uh, one of them is a AAAF service from a CLC, uh, which uh, Shane will know very well. So we are doing experiments actually trying to harvest uh, what uh, Shane's team uh, makes available, and we test that uh, within our, our own system. Like, can we harvest it well? Does it contain the metadata that could be useful in the Europeana context? I mean, it's, uh, it's not that we intend to include uh, the OCLC content in Europeana, but it's a very good case study uh, because we have a lot of, uh, of shared, shared concerns. So in general, what works well for OCLC, I mean, all the metadata concerns that Shane has highlighted, if they work well for OCLC, they would work well for us. So it's really great to be, uh, to be able to do some, uh, some experimentation in a shared setting. So my conclusions. Uh, why has Europeana invested in AAAF? So it allows us to better fulfill our mission. And really, that's on very different levels. So it's not just one thing. Uh, our investment is about ingesting and sharing links to AAAF resources, so the basic the, the, the infrastructure stuff, so to say. Uh, so we benefit from AAAF in terms of better viewing experience. Uh, we participate in the AAAF community, and that, well, I hope that now you are convinced that it brings us a lot of uh, a lot of benefits. Uh, we promote AAAF, uh, and uh, we do a lot of R&D around uh, the AAAF technology, and that's that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I like the way you did this. Yeah, that, well, that, that, that's, that's the only work. way it works, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can you keep this near your mouth? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so I've been instructed I have to keep this near my mouth at all times, so I'm going to try and do my best. Uh, my name is Paul Gooding. I'm a lecturer in Information Studies at the University of Glasgow, and uh, thanks very much to Tisha for inviting me. It's fantastic to be here. It's my first trip to the Netherlands, let alone Leiden, so it's, uh, I brought the, the rain from Glasgow, basically. It, when it, I was saying this earlier, whenever I go anywhere, it stops raining in Glasgow, which if you've ever been, is a really unusual activity, and it starts raining wherever I am. So blame me entirely for that. Um, so I'm going to be speaking today uh, about a project that I'm principal investigator for called the Global Dataset of Digitized Text, GDD Network, which I found much easier to say. Um, and it's been going since around January time. I'm going to talk about some, some of the work that we've been doing today. 
uh, to date, sorry. So just a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to introduce a little bit about the network, and then I'm going to explain some of the context, sort of some of the driving logic behind why we wanted to set up this network. Uh, and then I'm going to look at a, two of the pieces of work that we've been doing to date. So the first of these pieces is uh, 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 the holdings analysis. We've been doing some data matching. And the second piece of work that we've been doing is looking at use cases for a potential data set like this. And then I'm going to finish up by wrapping up with some next steps, because this is very much a prototypical network, I think it's fair to say. It's very much a work in progress. We're about um, a third of the way through the period that we have funding for. So it's all kind of very much a work in progress, and we're looking towards the next things to sort of, you know, reaching out to people and, and growing the network that we have in order to to, to push this work forward. So just to start with, these are the core partners working on the project. As I said, my, uh, I'm from the University of Glasgow. We're the lead organization on this. And Hutty Trust, as you'll be very familiar with, are the co-investigators on the project. We're also working with the National Library of Wales, National Library of Scotland, and the British Library. And we're also working with Research Libraries UK, who, again, several of you will be very familiar with. Fantastic organization with a huge membership of uh, primarily Russell Group, but other research libraries in the university sector, primarily in the United Kingdom. So the network itself is an AHRC, Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is one of the UK um, Research and Innovation Council um, funders. The project started in February 2019 and runs through to January 2020. And we're basically investigating the feasibility. <laughs> that's, a very, that, that, that's the interesting question, the feasibility of a global registry or data set of digitized texts. So more on that later, but I just wanted to start because I thought a few of you might not be quite so familiar with the, with the UK funding context that we're working within. So the Arts and Humanities Research Council in recent years um, has put a lot of effort into thinking about digital transformations in the arts and humanities. Um, a colleague of mine, um, Andrew Prescott, led for about the last five or six years a theme with the AHRC called Digital Transformations, and has been focusing on the implications of the digital shift for arts and humanities subjects. I'm particularly interested, as we picked up a few times in the other talks today, about the emergence of digital scholarship, digital humanities, and also increasingly, I think, data science is coming into the arts and humanities and social sciences as well. Uh, and also, the implications of born digital archiving are a huge topic of interest as well. And the, the, the topic of today, in fact, open publishing and open data. And the AHRC have been pushing this very hard as, as a priority for United Kingdom funding. This kind of led in um, October 2018 to a specific call for networks. Um, research networking scheme is designed for for developing collaboration and sort of prototyping and and taking forward ideas. It's not a funding scheme for for actually delivering a finished product. It's a funding scheme for sort of growing network and growing collaboration in order to lead to potential funding bids in future. So it's quite a, a small scale bid. It's around £60,000 overall, the large majority of which is going towards travel and networking and putting on events so that we can reach out to people and talk about the activities we're doing. So this project responded to that call specifically. And the call was designed to bring together cultural heritage organizations with the research sector in in universities in order to address digital scholarship in cultural institutions. We wanted to set out with this project to address uh, a key problem, which as we're all very familiar with, libraries, archives, and other cultural organizations are very heavily digitizing their collections. But it's not particularly all, um, it's not all um, coordinated. So it's very hard for researchers to make the best use of these growing collections. Discoverability across institutions can be very difficult in many cases. It's also very difficult for organizations, as it currently stands, to coordinate their efforts. And so, for instance, one of the areas we picked up on that the, the libraries that are involved very interested in is how might we use something like a data set like of, of digitized text in order to coordinate digitization efforts to avoid duplication of, you know, if, if something exists at the National Library of Wales, the National Library of Scotland, or even the National Library of South Africa, or a research library in the US might not want to digitize that if they're able to access it, if that information is available um, openly. Um, so, so there's kind of licensing implications to that. But, the, you know, the, this deduplication of effort is a real priority for the member libraries of the network, the founding members of the network. And also, we're, we're quite interested in what other forms of collaboration might emerge. And uh, I have the quote I'm borrowing from a colleague of mine. 
Uh, so I'm going to quote him. So I was chatting to William Kilbride, who's the, the CEO of the Digital Preservation Coalition, and he saw this as a real opportunity, for instance, for planning around digital preservation activities. So not necessarily as a platform for doing digital preservation, but he, and I'm going to quote him because he put it really well. He said, if one could build such a data set, it could be useful for all sorts of managerial functions in assessing preservation readiness of digital collections. Simply assessing whether each data set had a preservation agency and the extent to which they were willing or able to shoulder the preservation responsibility would be fascinating. So it may not act as, as the platform for doing that digital preservation, but it acts as a platform for knowledge exchange and identifying things like responsibility, who owns a specific piece of software, who's responsible for its preservation. We identified several beneficiaries for this. Firstly, we thought there was a lot of potential for digital scholars seeking large corpora of texts. So this, um, we, when we're envisaging this, we're very much envisaging this as a data set or a registry. We're not at this point in the process planning to make an, an aggregated platform which holds the content. It's more about aggregating metadata. But this would allow them to discover the metadata pertaining to digital collections potentially across the world if, if scale was achieved. It would also assist in discovery for those readers who are simply finding, wishing to find a digitized text or multiple versions of a digitized text. And as I've just explained, there is potential there for, for libraries who are undertaking digitization work to, to collaborate and to, to um, coordinate their digitization efforts, not just regionally or nationally, but potentially across national boundaries. And the project is aiming to, to verify the utility of this resource. So firstly, just to assess, is is there a demand for this resource? Is it something that's of interest to the various user communities? And secondly, to investigate the feasibility of actually achieving this. So obviously there's the scalability aspect, but there's a couple of areas that I'm going to go into today that I think are quite, quite interesting as sort of things that we're experimenting with through the project that would need to be done to deliver this. And I'll go back to them in a minute, but just to explain them, the objectives and deliverables of the network. So one of the objectives we had was to undertake a trial matching of data from the UK libraries that were involved in this project um, with existing Hattie Trust data set of digitized texts. And one of the key motivators for this is that we're really interested in developing a process for matching um, metadata records of, of specific texts. So we, we kind of had two scenarios in mind. The researchers are going to be interested in directly matching texts. So saying, is this text at this library identical to the text at this library? And secondly, clustering those texts. So texts that might not be identical, but might be different versions, different instantiations of a, a, you know, a, a 2013 version of a text as opposed to a 2011 version of a text. So those were kind of two challenges that we were setting out to, to achieve. So we're doing a trial of matching between the institutions involved. We're also going to be delivering that data set. We're hoping to make it a uh, openly available. Um, we're, we're sort of doing that at the moment. And we're also holding workshops to explore what sort of range of benefits might arise from a global data set of digitized text. And we're trying to reach out to different groups across the library, the academic sector, um, and, and also the vendor community in order to make sure that we're looking as widely as possible to assess what those benefits might be and also what is feasible to achieve. Finally, we're also looking to develop options for, for an ongoing and sustainable collaborative network of, of sort of relevant parties that would be able to take this forward with that ultimate goal of, of delivering a data set of digitized text. So although we're investigating some of these issues, the deliverable we have is much more modest. We're not claiming that by February 2020, we're going to have solved this issue because that, that, that would be insane, to be honest. Um, so I just wanted to, to sort of explain some of the context for the network. And actually, Tisha, it was really interesting to hear you pick up on the collective collection, because that was something that I also was, was interested in. Law Dempsey's report is, is well worth a read if you haven't come across it. And he described that the, the important trend of um, system-wide organization. So we were saying at the start that some activities in the sector have been relatively uncoordinated, although obviously with, with you know, people like OCLC, Europeana, Hati Trust doing a lot of fantastic work in this area, there is still a lot of uncoordinated work going on in digitization. But Dempsey was referring to this trend towards system-wide, whether that's across organizations as a consortium, whether it's regional or whether it's national. These activities are increasingly happening and it's an important trend, I think, in the, um, in the, the library sector. So, 
there are some characteristics that Dempsey picked out that I think are very important for this debate. So firstly, he picked out the um, what he called collective collection intelligence, and he was referring to the nature and quality of shared data being really important in facilitating both discovery and also shared knowledge. Secondly, he referred to the digital turn necessitating a sort of a different approach to preserving the scholarly record. There are different demands coming from researchers. There are different requirements coming from the library sector. And this requires us to think about how we manage and um, preserve our materials in different ways. Thirdly, he referred to the balance of responsibilities, which are varying. So different libraries have different missions and drivers. And one of the things we're very conscious with with our network is, as you saw at the start, it's, it's Hattie Trust and three UK national libraries. And the UK national libraries are going to have very different priorities and they're very different local drivers to, to uh, a small subject-based college in the US or the UK. So, so these issues are going to inform how people want to engage in these system-wide collaborations, whether they want to be taking data, whether they want to be part of a consortium, whether they want to be data providers, whether they want to be active in defining standards, whatever it might be, that's going to be informed by their local context. And finally, one of the really important things that I think need, needs um, flagging up is that Dempsey referred to the concept of ownership. The, the sort of the digital turn has been quite difficult for libraries because, you know, a, a print copy, there's been the assumption that we, we own that material. Whereas Dempsey talks about things not in terms of ownership, but in terms of rights. So he's thinking in terms of the what rights we have with our materials to do certain types of work, what we're allowed to do under things like copyright law, data, text mining exceptions, and also what we're not allowed to do with materials. And this is quite a complex thing because it's moving away from this, this concept of ownership towards this concept of rights. And a lot of this has been driven by mass digitization. There's been a huge area of growth in the last few years, and also the growth of data-driven research, which I've already alluded to a little. Um, but one of the really interesting things with, with this is thinking about what does this mean for us to call it a global resource? You know, because of the nature of the network, it was a US-UK collaboration, and we don't have any non-English language partners, except we actually do. So for those who are familiar with our national libraries in the UK, we have uh, obviously Leaver Deposit, which is gap capturing the UK um, national published record. But actually, the National Library of Wales and the National Library of Scotland, it just, just if you think within the UK, we have a huge amount of non-English language content. The National Library of Scotland is collecting Gaelic and Celtic materials. The National Library of Wales similarly is collecting Celtic and Welsh language materials. And if you multiply that across the world and consider the wide variety of languages and the problems of, of matching data across the globe, it becomes a massive issue. Um, so these are sort of the considerations that we have and also the representativeness of that network. How do you create a data set that is global enough and representative enough to be useful for these terms that we're, we're thinking in? So I want to briefly to say, for the purposes of the network, we're defining text quite in a quite limited way because we, you know, we have a limited amount of time and we have a limited amount of resourcing to do this project. So we're primarily looking at monographs for the purpose of this. But this is flexible, and we've got sort of some questions that we would, I would want to consider here: is what digitised text might we want to see included? What how feasible is it to include various types of text? Because again, every type of text to include creates a different challenge in terms of data matching, in terms of the types of metadata that are available, and in terms of the rights that people have to access and use that material. And secondly, what might the limits of a resource be? Effectively, what actually would fall outside the boundaries that we're talking about here? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the work we've been doing to date now. Um, so firstly, oh no, they're in the wrong order. I'm going to do the holdings analysis first, and then I'm going to talk about developing use cases, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the community engagement. And the use cases and the community engagement kind of go hand in hand a little bit, actually. So the next section, I should say, I'm not the expert in this. This, fun, this has uh, been done by some fantastic colleagues at Hattie Trust. So I'm going to try my best to explain what they've been doing. But I should say, if, they, if anyone has any really specific questions, I might need to act as an 
an intermediary and put you in touch with, with my colleagues at Hattie Trust. So the work's been done by Natalie Fulkerson, Josh Steverman, Martin Waring, and Heather Christensen. And the challenge, as I said earlier, on, is that we wanted to be able to do matching. We wanted to be able to say to, to researchers that are looking at materials or to libraries that are looking to, to avoid duplication, this record is the same as this record. This is the same instantiation of this text, or this is a cluster of similar texts. So we wanted to start off by doing this as a trial run to identify the overlap between the library partners and the IT Trust collections, but in a way that's designed to start developing a methodology for matching data across the library catalogues. So Hattie Trust has um, two types of data. Firstly, it has a system called Zephyr, which is their uh, records management system. And the files contained within that are in MARC format. They're contributed by Hattie Trust member libraries as part of Ingest. And Hattie Trust actually clusters all of these on OCLC number. So one of the requirements for Ingest with Hattie Trust is they require their partners to attribute an OCLC number to records that are contributed to Hattie Trust. They also have uh, what they refer to as a Hattie file. And the Hattie file is a tantalumated text file that represents every single item in the collection. This is derived from Zephyr, but it's actually released online. I think they do a daily, is it daily updates. So they do a daily update which says all of the daily or weekly update which says all of the new records that have been uploaded to Hattie Trust since the last update, and then they do a monthly update which is a complete record of all the files, all, all the all the data within Hattie Trust. So these are the things that we're using. And the Hattie file derives its bibliographic records from Zephyr. It uses things like rights and access codes, and it also attributes various Hattie Trust related administrative identifiers. And so for the project, we ended up with, with quite a large number of records. We, um, we sourced the MARC records for digitized texts from the various partners. So the British Library, you can see, is a huge number. They're, they they gave their uh, 19th century monograph collection. So this was digitized, I think, as part of the Google Books and part of the Microsoft digitization efforts a while back. So just over half a million records came from the British Library. The National Library of Scotland gave us just over 10,000 digitized records, but also uh, a, a data dump, effectively, of 9.5 million print records from their collections. Similarly, the National Library of Wales gave us just over 2,000 digitized, uh, digitized rec records for digitized text and 3 million print records. So we're talking quite, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so the digitized records would be within the print records. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I know the BI didn't give us any print records because of the, the complexity of the various standards they have and the various areas they have. It was, we, we, we kind of concluded it was too complex to do that for this, the, the, this project. So I'm going to go through some of the approaches. I'm going to go quite quick because otherwise I'll be here all day because they've done some fascinating work. Um, but we, we tried, they tried a variety of approaches for this. So ultimately, it was about iterating an approach that allows us to do two things, to identify matches with high precision and high recall. And for those who aren't particularly familiar with those terms, precision refers to being able to identify that a record is what it says it is. So effectively, being confidently able to say, this record does refer to this similar record. Recall is being confident that we've captured all the records that refer to that. So they're slightly different things, but they're both important in terms of doing data matching. Um, the first thing we did was we, we simply attempted to match the library holdings to the Hattie file using the OCLC number. We were very confident that pretty much all, not all of the records with Hattie Trust, but the large majority of records from Hattie Trust had the OCLC number attached to it. So we started with this as a very simple one. What we found was that this was, was really just an, a, a, a non-starter because the, the numbers of OCN records that you can see there are so low with the member of libraries that there was very little work that we could do to match. And again, and this is partly symptomatic of the data that we were looking at. The BR being 19th century materials had very little of that data attached to it. And we found remarkably low records, low matching rates for this material. So this was kind of, to be honest, put on the scrap heap quite quickly, as you'll guess a couple of the others were as well. Um, the second one was to consider what other usable identifiers were available. So I've just got ISBNs here as an example. And again, this was extremely difficult. If you're thinking about digitized materials, although there are organizations like Google digitizing contemporary materials, a lot of the efforts to digitize have been referring to material that predates ISBNs. So if you're trying to identify materials by ISBN, as you can see here, we had to 
the maximum we found was 55 ISBN numbers across the digitized records, and uh, about roughly a third of the National Library of Scotland print records had ISBN numbers. So again, if you're thinking about the, the recall, if you're thinking about being able to identify all the relevant records here, this again is just a non-starter, and is again kind of symptomatic of the data that we're looking at. So we started moving on towards more exploratory methods, the first of which was just to do a literal string match of title fields in the library data sets in the Mark 245 title field. And this started to get us a bit further. The problem with this is that it was doing a literal match. It wasn't even doing any, any processing. It wasn't, it wasn't decapitalizing. It wasn't doing any fuzzy logic. It was just literally trying to match strings of text. And we started to see around a, a 3% match maximum here. Of course, we're not expecting there to be a 100% match across the collections. But we're, again, we're not thinking realistically that this is showing us how many records are actually matched. So we moved on to doing a bit of processing. So effectively doing the down casings I referred to and also removing non-alphanumeric characters. And we can see here that this was a bit more successful. We saw a 16% overlap with the digitized records in the National Library of Scotland collection. We saw an 11% overlap with the National Library of Wales. So we're starting to get a sense that we're moving towards a solution, perhaps not a solution. And I should say by the end, we still haven't reached a solution, but we have some findings and proposals. So we moved on to a more exploratory method, um, another exploratory method, sorry, which was a word-by-word -word match on the Mark 245 field. So for each BL title, which we did as a test, we effectively downcased, eliminated stop words, and created a, a bag of words, and then searched the Hutty file for each of those bags of words, and then determined the position and recall to calculate an average confidence score. So effectively saying, how confident are we that this is a match? And then the, uh, the output was a list of candidate OCNs for each record with that corresponding confidence score. So you can see an example here, which was uh, the BL title, St. Paul at Philippi, a Suetonian poem. And we can see three different ones here. The first one, which uh, picks up on a couple of those words and gives you a confidence score of about 0 0.5. Similarly, the second one gives a confidence score of 0 0.5. What we found with this, it was quite effective. Once we got above 0 0.8, as a confidence score, how to trust the finding that they could be reasonably confident that it would be a match. It wasn't a guarantee, but 0.8 was the kind of tipping point where the accuracy was enough to start identifying matches. Oh, wrong way. So they moved on a little bit further and started looking towards machine learning. Um, and they, they adopted the work of, uh, continued the work of Michael Morris Pierce, who's a former colleague of theirs, uh, who I think is now the California Digital Library. And they queried, they, they sort of said, can you train a support vector machine classifier to distinguish between title matches and non matches? So they went through the sort of standard machine learning process of doing a setup, training it against a sample data set, and then implementing it uh, against a larger data set. And what they didn't do, because as anyone who's done machine learning will know, this is hugely complicated computationally expensive, they didn't run this against all the records they had. This is very much an experimental test phase which they run against a small sample. And these are the results. So they run it with two with polynomial algorithms and uh, Gaussian as well. So this is the bit where I'm a bit woolly about what they are. So if anybody has done this, then please weigh in. Um, but we suddenly found that these were really giving us very high precision and recall on both fronts. So we can see here where we, before we had 0.8 precision. Across the entire data set we looked at, we were getting over, um, over 0.9 precision and recall on both counts. So we're starting to move towards a solution that enables us to say with reasonable confidence these records are the same. But we learned a few things from this. Firstly, we learned that duplicate detection is really hard. It's not just a matter of aggregating data and allowing discovery. It's a matter of actually being able to say to people confidently, this record is the same. And we have a situation where, as you'll all know from looking at library metadata, some organizations use short titles, some use long titles, some just make spelling mistakes, publisher data, you know, the publisher field can vary. It's, it's just fantastically complex to do this work. And also, once you start getting into different manifestations of the same work, you start having to cluster that material because it's not necessarily a direct match, but it is clustered. And 
because it's so hard to do with simple computational methods, there's a trade-off here. We found that those resource-intensive methods were, were much better at um, providing high recall and high precision for our task. But of course, that then means that you've got a hugely computationally expensive process. And it's not really scalable. If you think back to this idea of the global network, that's totally not a scalable activity to start doing machine learning across hundreds of millions of records. So the implications for aggregation was, was how do we uh, express this relationship to registry users? Do we start sort of mapping, graphing? There were some experiments from Hutter Trust, which I haven't kind of got time to show here, where they started mapping on, on, an, on a line how precisely things matched so that people could go, okay, well, this record's over here somewhere. This record's quite low. But it, so we kind of reached the point with this where, where we've concluded that machine learning has potential, but we think taking it forward that what we need to do is perhaps look to combine some of the less computationally expensive methods to do preliminary sifts, the ones that have high recall rather than high precision perhaps, in order to then identify with high precision those subsets. So this is, as I said, a work in progress. And then the second part of the work we've been doing is we've been looking at use cases for digitized texts. So at our first team meeting in Chicago, we did a brainstorming session. So this, this is the results of the brainstorming and the results of the London workshop on the, on on the right-hand side. And so we just, we, we just brainstormed agile user stories. So as a such and such, I want to do such and such so that I can such and such. So we have some examples here. I've got some examples on the next slide as well. And then when we took it to the London workshop, which actually happened last week, we had a, a George Bingham from OCLC there. We had a, a great group of people. And we kind of got them to do some further brainstorming to identify additional user stories. So you can see the additional user story on a post-it down the bottom there. That wasn't one of ours. That was one of the workshop ones. And then we asked people to do an investment exercise. Effectively, we gave people 50 stickers and said, if this was money, if this was 50,000, 500,000, 5 million, how would you allocate these resources to the various use cases? And then we took that forward with a group discussion around feasibility, key stakeholders that would need to be involved, and ways forward. Five things kind of emerged from this in our preliminary analysis. The first was efficiency, cost, impact, and value. And it's got the, the most common case study for this was as a collections manager, I want to know what's already been digitized so that I can avoid duplication of effort. The second one was discovery and access. As a reader, I want to easily remotely access a digital resource so that I can find the information I'm after. The third one was provenance. So the example in the most popular one was as a digital scholar, I want to understand the provenance of the data set so that I can put the digitized materials in context and apply my own relative source to the score, e.g. how much I trust this. So this wasn't actually about the content. This was quite an interesting one. This was about the reliability of the data rather than the reliability of the content. So they're actually thinking of it at a step before the content. Research was the fourth one. And again, we, we have quite a high representative digital scholarship. So our use cases were kind of slightly biased actually towards digital scholarship, which was, was interesting in itself. And again, the example of a digital scholar, I want to download a list of links to digitize text from different libraries so that I can create a corpus specific to my needs. And the final one is product, product and service development. And I've kind of left this blank, although we did have some examples because we the, the group that we had, and it was one of the interesting outcomes, was kind of biased, I think, towards research libraries and digital scholarship. We didn't have too many vendors in the room. And when it came to voting, the, the service development, the, the, the vendor benefits were kind of underrepresented. And we were curious because we thought, well, this, this seems like it might be a function of the people in the room rather than a function of the lack of potential benefits here. So I kind of left that blank, although it was an area that emerged. We found there was that bias towards research due to the presence of people involved in digital scholarship. Um, we also found that library service providers were underrepresented. So what we, we followed up with this is with our thinking is we need to identify and reach out to new stakeholder groups where the, where the network is still ongoing to, to, um, to bulk up the sense of what this might do for other sectors. The big one 
is that the scope and extent of that data set needs careful definition. This again came out of the use cases. Many assumed use cases were built around the idea that it would provide direct access to a digitized text. Effectively, they were seeing this as kind of an aggregator in the, in, in the line of things like Europeana, rather than a data set which would allow them to do different kinds of work. And the focus for us to date has been on unifying metadata, not aggregating full texts. So I think there's an element of communication on part of the project and also an element of, of scoping what that might look like. So just to wrap up, uh, we've been doing two, we had two workshops in terms of community engagement. We had a workshop last week, which is the one I've just been talking about, so I won't go through that one again. We're also going to be holding a workshop at the University of Glasgow in December 2019, and we're going to be presenting the prototype data set and the final results of our overlap analysis, because the thing I've very carefully left out here is how many of the collections we currently think overlap, because we're not entirely sure that work is finished yet. Uh, we're also looking to identify possible next steps towards that global data set and to establish the feasibility of the various options. So what is fundable, what is technically feasible, and what is actually beneficial to the various communities. So we're doing an ongoing program of, um, of, of raising awareness. We're, we're here today, obviously. Uh, we're also going to be um, reaching out to Hattie Trust and our UK member organizations. I'm going to be speaking at the DCDC conference, which several of you may attend, which is going to be in Birmingham, I think, in November 2019. And we're also looking at other opportunities, because I think part of this is, is working out how to engage with and, and find other groups beyond that US, UK context and beyond the national library context in order to enrich what we're doing. And I'm pressing the wrong button. Um, so yeah, I will, I will skip through that one because that's kind of what we've been doing. Generally, I want to say the two key deliverables that we're presenting in December are that prototype data set and an accompanying report that I'm leading on, which is going to be analyzing existing efforts and the potential benefits and, and sort of trying to identify the, the sort of uniqueness of this product so that we're not, um, we're not sort of replicating existing efforts. Okay, so that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. So time for questions now. Yes. Well, it was, um, thank you very much, first of all, and uh, Antoine uh, shared this uh, record of uh, the scroll. And all three speakers kind of touched upon it, um, but I didn't uh, get any conclusive something out of it. Basically, I was wondering if there were um, any ideas about sustainability and if there's space for it, because imagine if every institution, for instance, is um, trying to digitize their collection and they're taking you know, thousands of pictures of what they're doing. That's my question. Do you need some clarification of the question? Because I'm looking, you're looking puzzled. <laughs> Could you try one more time? Yeah, so um, basically what I was wondering, yeah, was if there's space in the design or in the way of sharing um, for sustainability. Because I'm wondering what, uh, you know, if every institution is making so many files, uh, how much energy does it actually cost to store these images? And to, make, and to make them discoverable. Sustainability, is is this affordable for at the institutional level? Yeah. Well, actually, I'm, I'm tempted to dodge that that question and to refer to uh, to what Tisha presented, it's I mean it relates to the the value and the investment that the uh, the institutions do. If I understand uh, if I understand well, so what what kind of benefits these institutions uh, see in this digitization and how it relates to their uh, their missions as uh, providing access to their their collections. Uh, so. I mean, I think I think your study shows that there's quite some some commitment, uh, and a lot of these missions are now really key uh, to the uh, to the institution's role and and actually to their uh, their funding. I mean, now a lot of the uh, the funding of our partners is connected to their commitment 
uh, to openly provide access to uh, to their contents. And if they don't do that, they don't get the full funding. And I, I think there's a there's another issue here because it's a it's a really good point. And there have there have been, as we all know, many things that haven't been haven't been sustainable. You know, that have been done on project funding and have kind of died out at the end of it. I think one of the things that's really important at this point is. Um, you know, in, in terms of material that's been digitized, there's been huge investment in that. And and I think, to, to me at least, what a lot of libraries are looking at is how they can derive the most value from the investment they've already made. And so one of the elements of sustainability is actually looking at new ways of discovery and new ways of reuse so they can see that their collections are being used, maximize the benefit to their users and maximize the existing investment. And I think if, if, if libraries can can do that, then that aids the case for for making things sustainable. But you're right, it, it's a huge challenge. It does it does require ongoing investment, and I think perhaps again a, a collaborative view, so that when projects are ending, for instance, that there's some sort of collaborative view as to how how materials can be can be preserved in an ongoing way. Yeah, and I think so. You know, we're we're looking only at the lens of Content DM users, so it's we have a. We have a relationship from the very beginning of the workflow all the way to the end. So looking at exactly what um, you two just said, maximizing the value of the material you already have certainly helps in terms of increasing your exposure, increasing the utility of the material you've already produced and already put online. So there's that kind of uh, value proposition at the end. But I think also we're really focused on the staff effort side of it. So people are already spending time describing materials and they're not getting the maximum value from the way they're describing them today. So we're looking at how we can make better tools to lead right into maximally valuable materials. So there's, there's kind of two sides of it. It's like promote what you already have, but also reduce the effort. You know, try, try to just make it easier to describe tons of material. So that it gets at the, it nibbles at the edges of the sustainability question, I think. Yeah, and maybe maybe adding that there's probably a technology uh, component to uh, to your your question, and uh, we've witnessed that institutions now better understand uh, the technology and what what kind of benefits uh, they can do. I mean, comparing what we see now in the AAAF community when a cultural heritage institution is engaged in that community and how they perceive the value of the technology for them. When we compare that to what happened in uh, some European related projects that, yeah, as you mentioned, died, uh, it's clear that there's, there's a real evolution with the way they approach technology and what it can bring to them. I mean, sometimes we had projects that were just producing like, low, low, low resolution uh, digitization. They were using some technology, but they did not have much clue uh, how to use it and what it could bring to them. And now it, this, this awareness uh, has changed a lot, and I believe that it's also connected to the, the technology itself. So when, when you see what AAAF allows for researchers, for example, it, it's clear that there are some, some use cases which are, which are of clear value. Other question? Yes. Um, teacher, I have a question for you. You were uh, elaborating on the um, the strategy of uh, OCLC to um, build a terminology around open content. I was wondering, could you elaborate a little bit more why you um, use open content as a concept uh, instead of open data, or how does it relate, um, and what's the choice for OCLC? to do that um, it's pragmatical choice it, it has nothing to do with intellectual discussions that are going on around you know how do you name things uh, open content or open data um, but it's also it's a way to talk with our community about um, open um, and whether it's content or text or data. Um, I know that in, in Europe, and especially with the open science discussions, um, 
we are more and more talking about data. Everything is data, um, collections as data, data as collections, you know, everything is becoming fluid and, um, the, and, and at the same time that makes also, that creates a problem because what are we talking about? So on the one hand, it's logical that we talk about collections as data because we are increasingly um, using collections in, uh, as bags of bits, you know, um, so as data. Um, but at the same time, it, it does make sense sometimes to talk about um, collections more specifically. Are we talking about print collections? Are we call, talking about digitized collections? It's different from born digital collections, the way we handle them. We, so, so uh, yeah, it's for us at this time, it was just very pragmatical consideration. Let's call it open content and it just um, encapsulates everything. Yeah. Several questions. Uh, thank you very much. It's very interesting and uh, informative. Uh, my first question is for Shane. Uh, we at Radboud University, I'm now starting, we are starting to use content DM more and more, but we mostly use compound uh, objects. So with, the, with that change discovery API, is it also possible with compound objects? Yeah. yeah, okay. And I can imagine that we would want to have a feed on the university library website where we can show new books that we've added to, to content DM. So is, would it also be able with that API to uh, choose sp uh, specific pages? Because some pages are more interesting than others, maybe with, with, with nice pictures on them and then we can show them. Is that possible? So first, the uh, Change Discovery API isn't even in production yet. It, the API itself hasn't been finalized. Our goal is to produce, to support it once it's final. The, the Discovery API, it's my understanding, it's really intended to be across, either across the repository or across the set, the collection. Um, I don't know, has there been discussion of like a curated list of uh, from within the Change Discovery API? That's certainly, you know, we want to do what people would find useful as well. So if you, you know, articulate a need around that, that's something we would look into. But I think maybe Antoine, you can speak to that point. Uh, yeah, and I may disappoint you a bit. Uh, it, it's completely agnostic uh, to what is being, uh, being discovered. So basically, IIIF provides the, the means to, to showcase your stuff and to, cur to curate it as you see fit uh, in other areas of the APIs. So it's possible to create collections and sub-collections. It's also possible to focus the presentation of a certain object on specific parts of it. Uh, so the, in, in my example from, from Switzerland, so there was this thing where they had split the, the big scroll into pieces, which was not really needed. Uh, but then nonetheless decided to do it. And actually it could be possible that up front uh, they would have put one specific extract from this scroll so that it would appear as the, uh, the focus point for the, for the viewing. And there could be a collection of these focal points uh, published as IIIF collections. And so it's, it's possible. It's entirely up to uh, the, the, the curators and to the tooling uh, that would be deployed on top of the, uh, the, the standard AAAF tech. Yeah. So that's the thing, right? I want to have yeah. build my collection, and from there, the API would select the maybe with some guidance from my end, the correct pages I want to show in that feed. So now I have to build those, if I want to show those pages in a feed, I have to build them. <laughs> yeah. That would be a feature for a system. Yeah, and I think. Yeah. So in the next release of ContentDM in, in a week, we will be automatically producing collection manifests, triple IF collection manifests. That's within the, that's collection as defined in ContentDM. So every item in your ContentDM collection will be available in that form. But as Antoine just said, the collection manifest concept lets you define any collection you want. Right now, you would have to build the JSON but, you know, so, so the state we're at today, you would have to create that JSON document. Um, but it's definitely an area we're intrigued by. So 
some light, it would be a fairly lightweight UI. It could even be a query driven. It could just be based right off of your metadata. You produce a sub collection and convert it into a manifest form. So there are definitely provisions. There's ways to do it, um, but it's not, there's not a, you know, today there's not a UI where you just go click, 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 and these are the seven items I want. Um, but, you know, let's keep talking. Uh, it's an uh, it's evolving uh, area for us. I yeah, I don't know. And I think we need to take a break of 10 minutes at least so that we can just walk around, go to the toilet if you want. The toilets are that way out and then on the right-hand side. And if we are back here at 12, then we can continue the session. Thank you.
which is, uh, I mean, it produces two Yeah, yeah, we have written uh, that where we the current uh, quality of vibration. Is everybody back? Can I ask you to sit down, please? We are going to continue the session. And then you can continue the conversation during lunch. Ja, sorry dat ik de ja, het spijt me, maar het is mijn allemaal bovenop elkaar gepropt. Ja. We gaan weer beginnen.
Please sit down. <laughs> kan jij... Dat kunnen zij doen, ik kan dat niet. Zit te graag. Are you going to stretch and play? Okay. Um, you want this? <laughs> That's too far away. Most people sit here, so Jen, you can sit here if you want. Okay. Everybody back? <laughs> so we're going to continue the session one more hour, um, and then we'll have lunch. I have put a, a paper, a sheet on, on your seat. It's an evaluation form. Um, it would be nice if you if you'd fill it in and uh, give it to me before leaving the room. That would be really nice. Uh, we're going to continue now, and I think that Paul Paul's presentation was a very nice transition to what we're going to hear now from the next presenters, um, because he already introduced some of the terminology that we're going to hear more about. Uh, with the presentation of Shenghui and Rob, Anna Paula and Tom. So, Shenghui, please. Yeah, thank you, Tisha. Uh, I'm Shenghui Wang from the OCLC. Um, I'm a research scientist here. But um, now it's the time to talk about some deep interactions with open collection. At least our attempt to, to have some deep interactions. <clears throat> so we have four presenters here in this session including me. Uh, we are all part of this CATSIS project, visual, uh, visual Analytics for the World's Library Data. For a couple of years, we have been working together, trying to use visualization tools to show more value, try to show more value of the library data. And this is a collaboration between yeah, um, Technical University of Eindhoven, University of Amsterdam, and the OCLC OCS, OCS Research. And in this hour, we will focus more on one particular workflow of uh, okay the for the digital humanity researchers they start with questions and then try to collect some corpus and uh, do some data cleaning and um, for e using semantic embedding try to s extract more semantics from the textual data and of course, in our project, we do data visualization, try to see whether we can use visualization tools to help us to help the digital humanities researchers to answer their questions better or faster. So I will quickly go uh, give the floor to Anna Pola because she is the philosopher who has the questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, yeah, my name is Anna Paula Ginami. I'm a postdoc researcher in philosophy at the University of Amsterdam. And yeah, I will tell a bit about like our experience as a user, as uh, like philosophy researchers. So yeah, just to, to introduce the research group that I'm part of, it's called the Concepts in Motion group. Um, our specialization is history of philosophy of science, roughly from like the 18th century to the 20th century. Um, we have a history of ideas approach. So we try to trace like shifts of meaning in philosophical concepts, uh, concepts like truth, consequence, number, life. So we want to see like how these concepts developed. And yeah, we are trying to take the computational turn 
um, because philosophy, as it is traditionally done, like involves a lot of like close reading, very close reading, analysis of very limited um, sets of data. So some philosophers spent their entire career just studying the works of one philosopher. And we are trying to scale that up to make this history of ideas approach um, possible to trace larger amounts of uh, works um, to a larger time span. But actually we face a major challenge and that is the lack of existing high quality and easily accessible corpora. So what kind of corpora do we need? Um, so multi-language, multi-scripts, uh, books and articles from different historical uh, historical periods. <laughs> Very hysterical. Yes, yeah, so we study mainly German philosophers, but also English ones, Polish ones, um, philosophers that wrote in Latin and in Greek. Um, many of the German texts that we study are written in, in this Gothic typeface in Fraktur. So yeah, that's already a very diverse um, corpora and we study um, both like major philosophers, very well-known ones, there's also minor ones and some of them are uh, for example Kant is very well known, uh, Bolzano already a bit less, uh, Frege, Russell and Quine and ideally we want to study all their works. If we want to know for example like what is the concept of truth that Bolzano had, we want to be able to study like all his works. And the problem is that the works of these philosophers are often scattered among different repositories, for example, Google Books, Haiti Trust or Europeana. And the only thing that can be downloaded are like low quality scans, uh, PDF images of original printings uh, in Gothic typefaces. So. That makes it hard. So what are our, our, our uh, quality requirements? So what are the formats that we need in our research? So yeah, we like to be able to um, to use like uh, text mining tools, uh, distributional semantics, um, machine learning techniques. We like to explore like um, the possibilities of applying those methods. So the very minimal requirement we have for our text is just to have plain text. It would be better to have like TEI um, format, which is like this text encoding initiative. So it's the plain text plus some structural information. And even better is the TEI of the Deutsche Textarchiv, which is really a subset of the text specialized for uh, historical texts. But ideally, because we are yeah, like studying a lot of like mathematical texts, philosophy of mathematics, logic, so there are a lot of formulae in that. So ideally we want also the faithful renditions of those formulae and if possible also linguistic text but that is like really um, very far in the future for now. Um, so the corpus building, Rob is going to take over. Okay, then she has a list of works. Um, it's not really metadata they have, they just have a list of these books we want to have scanned. So my task was to see whether there are some open sources available to scan those books, uh, to find those books. Uh, obvious is the Internet Archive, there's a ton of information there. The Hathi Trust, also a nice data set. There's also more obscure books, AT Trust, and Google Books of course. So, Internet Archive, um, this is one example, Wissenschaftslehre, I think you could translate it to science. Um, as you can see, it's all fracture, if you can see it, you have a lot of choices, so you feel very happy. <laughs> Unless you look at it. <laughs> I don't know whether you can even read this. <laughs> I guess with a lot of AI you could turn it into something. <laughs> Oops. Um, so what about it? Searching is okay, but always slow. And there's a problem because uh, 
the metadata is not so good. So if you want to find something, you have to find look into it in multiple ways. Normally, I would just look for the author and one like Bolzano and then say everything between those two year ranges and who very fuzzy match. Uh, then you find out that not, not all works of Bolzano are so popular and scanned. So you find only a fraction of the total. And if you find something, you have to find the one with the best uh, text. My clicker. Then you go to Hathi Trust and you feel a lot happier because you have more heads, the data, the data is much cleaner, so it's much easier to find things. So uh, then you have this problem. It's, it's totally open source, so everyone should have access. And even the Hathi Trust libraries agree that everyone should have access, so you look at. And it said the use of material in Hathi Trust may be defined by third party agreements. For instance, libraries agreement with Google requires to take steps to prevent bulk download. Means uh, no luck. <laughs> then we go to Google Books, and then we find out A, they have a very nice API, their metadata is quite nice, and their text, the underlying texts are much better. It looks like that Google is silently improving their fracture reading and all those things. Uh, the API, as when I did it, was it could do 1,000 queries a day unless you pay. And now it says uh, they decide how many queries you can do in a day, and you should not circumvent it. Uh, the API for looking for public material is free. So you should, in theory, uh, don't need an account, but still I took an account because if you don't have an account, they randomly don't reply. <laughs> so they're throttling it, but it's not clear why and how. So I was not very happy. The good news is all those things have APIs and all have different APIs. And uh, like the archive, sometimes the API is very complicated. In Google, sometimes the API is very easy. But each source has a different API, which makes it very expensive to go to this data set. And uh, you cannot get as much data as you want. And there's no standards for metadata and lacking. So discovery is very fuzzy. So what you do, you find everything, and then you do a very fuzzy matching and find the best match. So that's the same idea about uh, data quality in, in, in general. But both precision is low and recall is low because yeah, sometimes more text, sometimes less text, and sometimes text is totally missing. And if you look with the wrong query, then you have no results, you don't know why. And I think the OCR uh, varies a lot and the text layer is not always okay. So, I had to tell them, no luck. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so that was the situation. And uh, of course, we wanted to do our research anyway. So yeah, what are the solutions that we found? Um, the first of them was to have our books professionally OCR'd and corrected by a company. Uh, which is about one euro per page, and we have a uh, high quality TXT with about like the OCR is about 99% accuracy. So that means every hundred words we have a word which is not correct. That's a lot for uh, philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean we are doing very yeah, like to 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 apply the text very well like this. Meanings are very important. So if the if the words get not recognized correctly, then we have a problem. So yeah, another solution is the cooperation with the Deutsche Stacks Archive, um, like the ones that have um, the format that works very well for us, like specifically for historical texts. And yeah, they have a lot of German text um, online, openly accessible but only very few of the ones that we are interested in. Um, so yeah, we started to, we are trying to start um, 
a cooperation with them so that we pay some money to have our tax uh, processed in their, pro in their um, uh, procedure and then put online and made openly accessible. But then we have to pay still uh, three euros per page. And they have like, they outsource um, the process and then we obtain a text like with, um, yeah, with shortcuts in their XML. So then we have to do a lot of manual work still to obtain the right structural information. So that is the story. So also that is not ideal. And yeah, to give an idea, like we, for example, for Bolzano, we have a large part of his works and that's about uh, 11,000 pages. So yeah, these are, we're talking about a lot of money for us. So yes, so yeah, uh, the first route that we follow. So if we obtain high quality TXT, what do we have then? So we obtained um, folders con uh, containing the OCR scans of the printed material, both in déjà vu and in TXT format. And all, all those files corresponded either to a book or to a section of a book. And the file names were completely non-monomic, so we had to look every time at the files, look at the document itself, see which book it was, because yeah, it was not a we were not able, if we had a book in mind, to just open the right file immediately. And the files contained a lot of paratextual elements, like title pages, editors, prefaces, and multiple sets of notes, both of the author itself and of the editor. And um, yeah, so we know like uh, from yeah, our philosophical work that ideally we would like to have like uh, paragraphs as the units of text analysis, but like these files had no paragraph markers, so we had to segment on sentence level. But also that was quite problematic. So yeah, clean, cleaning the data to, to be able to apply some tools. Um, we had to segment on sentence level and we had this basic approach. So a sentence is anything between two periods. Well, then we had many false positives. Uh, for example, abbreviations. In German, und so weiter, us, we, every time with a period. Um, abbreviations of publication titles, uh, reverence conventions, and many other problems. So we obtained, like, yeah, very many false positives. And it looks uh, like this, for example. This is, um, yeah, two pages from a book from Bolzano. And then, for example, does the pointer work? Yes. Then we look at this part, like here, a sentence starts. Then we have here a footnote and the sentence ends here on this page. So zoomed in like this, the sentence starts oh yeah, here and then goes on until here. And that looks like this in the TXT file. So we obtained, what is it like, nine different sentences um, from segmenting on sentence level by just looking at the periods. Well, this is unacceptable. Of course, we cannot uh, apply any computational tools on this. So, yeah, because here we have like send, um, periods. We have like this period textual elements like this um, horizontal sign, no, vertical sign, which was a marker for like in the original text of Bolzano there, that was where a page ended or something like that. And then the footnote, which was on the bottom of the page, comes in the middle of the text. So then uh, luckily uh, Sheng Wei helped us and um, yeah, did some semi-manual cleaning to get the results more acceptable. So yeah. Like she removed, for example, after page number indication, the dots. Um, if there was like a, a single letter in an author name, like this one, she removed the dots and also in the abbreviations. 
So what we obtained then was already much better. So at least we have one sentence here. But yeah, of course, we have still the, the footnote in the middle and we have still a page number. But at least, we, yeah, this is something that we could in theory work with. Okay, and then, yeah, to get things even better, we would like to have like the editorial insertions are removed, also the page numbers, and like the footnotes, uh, the limited, so not um, in the middle of some sentence where it occurred, where it happened to occur, like in the original book, but really marked as being a footnote. And also, um, yeah, remove hyphenation and like, um, yeah, to glue the words which were split up uh, together again. So yeah, this would be the desired result with just here the sentence and then here the footnote and also with some kind of footnote marker that we know that that was a footnote. So the problems that we encountered here, there were, like I said, the editorial markers. Um, also, like in the source text, they were in superscript, but not in the, not in the OCR file. They were sometimes just part of the normal text. Uh, some editorial is, is insertions, um, such as angled brackets, were not recognized and just replaced with other signs. And also, like we as uh, philosophers, we want to see, we want to be able to see when an insertion is done by an editor or when it is something like what belonged to the um, original text. So I, actually, like the removal of the editorial markers is only in order if we are also able to go back to the source file. So from the computational tool that we have, go back to the source file immediately to see like whether something was indeed part of the original text, yes or no. So the moral of the story is that for us, like even perfect OCR is not good enough. We really need some structure. And yeah, we of course, as a group of philosophers, we cannot do that ourselves. So we need other people uh, to do that for us. And now, Sheng, we will go on again. Okay. Now we're talking about uh, something a bit distant from philosophy. Um, <laughs> cement, uh, it's about cement embedding. So as Anna Pona just introduced uh, from the original text like this, we, uh, we processed it into sentences. So here you have um, uh, the book, uh, you know where which book it's from, and the section uh, number, unfortunately for this book, we couldn't extract section number, but we do know which paragraphs it's in and which sentence it is. So this text looks much better than the previous one. You can actually work with it. Um, so, oops, uh, how does it work? Okay. So once you have some kind of workable text, um, you can, of course, do the exact search. That's immediately possible. But you can also desire for some kind of semantic search because philosophy, philosophical concepts are abstract. They often express in different ways in different parts of the book, and get the context is much more helpful for understanding what the author mean, meant at the time. So for us, uh, as OCLC has been tried um, to work with semantic embedding for a couple of years. First, I will give you some kind of foundation. Basic idea is if you want to know the word, you look at the context of the word, and then that will give you some kind of indication of what this word means. This is probably a bit abstract for you. This is a, a famous example of body work. Take a few seconds, read a few sentences of this. As a common person, and probably already guessed, this is kind of a wine. So basically, the idea is really for cement embedding, uh, trying to get the context. You study the context, find a way to represent the context to in to uh, get you know the what this word really mean. Um, so concretely, the word embedding for us is basically you, try, you try represent the word as vectors of numbers. Uh, so here you have numbers to represent um, dog, cat, those animals. The most importantly is semantically similar words 
should be mapped to nearby points. So they are closer in the semantic space. By measuring how close they are in the semantic space, you can kind of guess how close they are in terms of meaning. So there are a lot of ways to embed, uh, to try to get the uh, word embedding. In OCLC, we develop our own method, is trying to use random projection for embedding. Uh, so here, basic idea is you have a C is a matrix. Um, that's the only thing in math here. Um, so you have a co-occurrence between uh, all the entities because we work mainly with the bib records. So you have authors, citations, subjects. So we'll count how many things co-occur with each other. And you have a count big matrix C there multiplied by a random matrix R. And then you end up with a C prime, which is much smaller representation of the original thing you want to embed. After we process it in this Bolzano corpus, we embedded uh, about 20,000 terms, uh, words or phrases, into S256 uh, dimensional vector. More importantly, we also embedded this more than 82,000 sentences we extracted from this. 30 something books of Bozano. And then um, the point is at the moment, uh, no, so now the terms and sentences are all embedded in the same semantic space. So in this semantic space, we can calculate anything the, to anything. So giving me a term or concept, um, then we can find the most related sentences which Bozano wrote about this concept. So that enables us to to enable the digital uh, philosophers to look for, I, ha I have a concept in mind, where in these 30 something books have, has Bozano wrote about it, uh, written about it. Um, for us, w of course, OCLC, we can do a lot with semantic embedding, uh, immediately information retrieval, but more libra from library perspective, we can do in disambiguation, deduplication, and helps matching, actually matching different metadata acts, uh, in this DDD network, <laughs> the, the problem there. Um, but of course, we have a partner in this Catfish project. Uh, we want to see whether um, we can do something visually with this uh, embedding. That's why I have to call Tom, because he is the expert in visualization. Thank you. Uh, so, my name is Tom Kastermans. I'm with uh, TU Eindhoven as a PhD student and involved in the CATFIS project together with my supervisors. Um, yeah, so as Shengwei already introduced, now we have this semantic space, and maybe if you didn't follow all of the details just now, now is the time to snap back in. So, the important thing to remember here is uh, we, we have similarities between concepts. and now we want to make that um, visible. <laughs> ah. Right. Um, yeah. So we this is embedding is very abstract. So we want to make this more concrete, and uh, we are going to do this by actually visualizing these distances or similarities. Um, and I want to show you two ways of doing this. Uh, mostly to introduce the next part of our presentation. Um, so first I want to discuss how visual cues work, and this is a very, very, very brief introduction into what visualization can do, so please bear with me. Um, but the thing is, our, our visual system is very good at certain things. So if you look at these three figures, um, then I guess that all of you will see groups. So, uh, for example, in the leftmost figure, you don't just see uh, a matrix of uh, circles and squares, but you actually see columns of groups because the human vision groups uh, things that look alike. Similarly, in the middle figure, you will see these uh, groups that share a region. And finally, and that's the thing that I want to use uh, next, in the last picture, you will again see columns of dots because they are slightly closer together. So there's slightly more room horizontally than there is vertically, uh, which is why you see groups. 
So now the idea is that we are going to use actual distances in 2D space to encode similarity between concepts. And now how do we do this? Well, <coughs> we actually uh, draw a dot um, for every concept. And if two dots are close together, then they are very similar. And now to make this, to give this slightly more structure, um, say that you search for a certain concept, then we put that concept in the center. So that's the sun of our solar system, which is why this is called solar view. Um, and then the distances to the most related terms are then shown by these concentric circles around the sun. Um, and these distances are as correct as they can be. And then we show all of the similarities between the other dots as well as we can. And this is a very technical thing, but you cannot get the distances exactly as they should be because this space is too small. That's what it boils down to. Um, but yeah, I could talk about this for a very long time, but I want to skip to the next thing, namely the second way that you can visualize these embeddings is uh, as a search interface. Um, because that's very familiar to most users and also very easy to work with for, say, philosophers. Uh, so what we do is um, you search for a concept again, and there are some sentences or paragraphs that are most related to that concept. Uh, so in this interface, on the right, you see a tab, and that tab has the uh, concept that you searched for, and you will just see a sorted list of most similar sentences or paragraphs below that. And if you uh, do a couple of more searches, then you will just, come on, you will just get more tabs. Um, so you will be able to quickly switch between what you searched for. And now there will also be some more information uh, next to the search results. So this interface shows um, for everything that you searched for so far, how related it is to the search results. Those are the small um, vertical bars there, if you can see them. And on the left, uh, all of the different works from, in this case, uh, Bolzano are shown. And it shows there if the, uh, the concept you searched for actually occurs in that particular work. And these components together make it very easy to, uh, well, do the research that a philosopher might do. Um, there are more requirements. There is more of a system behind this. I won't go into details here. For now, I just want to give the floor back to uh, Ana Paula to talk uh, further about how she can use this system. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I just want to show you like, um, yeah, what we as philosophers can do with an interface like this. So how do we, how do we use the data that we have computationally and how do we, yeah, use the tool both as, um, that Tom introduced. Um, so yeah, we had a specific research question about Bolzano's position within the de development of set theory. So set theory is nowadays like the common foundation for mainstream mathematics. And yeah, a big question for set theory was like, how do you develop the concept of number? And in particular, when you talk about infinite collections, like how do you count infinite things? So can you say, for example, there is a number to the collection of all natural numbers. And actually, like, yeah, human beings in general have two intuitions about um, concept of number. The one is the part whole principle, who says that the whole is always bigger than a proper part of it. And the other is the principle of one-to-one -one correspondence, um, which says that sets of which the members can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence are of equal size. So according to the first principle, it should take, for example, the concept of all natural numbers and the concept of squares. Then the concept of uh, the collection of natural numbers is bigger because there are more natural numbers than squares. Not every natural number is a square. 
But according to the second principle, um, the two days two collections are equally big because for every natural number there is a square because you can square it, and for every square um, you can take its root and you obtain a natural number again. So according to the second principle, the set of natural numbers and the set of squares are equally big. So these two principles are in conflict. And the second one is the principle that underlies set theory. So that is the one that has won, so to say, uh, in mathematics. Um, yeah, so Botano for a very long time reflected on these principles. He was also a mathematician. He's very famous also for his uh, mathematical works. And the received view is that uh, Botano never managed to see that he should have dropped the part whole principle and just go for one-to-one -one correspondence, as later Cantor did. But um, a couple of weeks before his death, actually, he wrote this um, this letter to a pupil of hers who says, like, um, he writes, about a particular uh, passage in the Wissenschaftslehre and says the thing is not only presented unclearly, but also, as I just began to recognize, entirely false. So then we go to look like what is this, um, this passage in the Wissenschaftslehre. So yeah, the details are not important here, but so the title of the section says no finite set of measures suffices to measure the width of all concepts. And then he's talking about the series in which the first term is like the collection of all natural numbers, the second, the collection of all squares, the third, the collection of all um, quadruples, so or fourth powers. And then he argues that like uh, the first time term is infinitely bigger than the second term, and the second term is infinitely bigger than the third term. So he's clearly arguing for the part whole principle. So, but yeah, in order to interpret this section to see what it actually means, um, so already the title for us it's not completely clear what Bolzano meant there. So in German, it's keine endliche Menge von Maßen genügend, die weit in alle Vorstellungen zu messen. And so there are some terms like weiten, for example. Um, yeah, either we are not familiar with it or we are familiar with the meaning right now and the meaning might have changed. So we want to be sure what Bolzano actually meant with that. And, and that is what uh, where Bovis comes in. So... Yeah, we make here a query for Vita for the concept of width. And yeah, here we have the most relevant passages uh, according to the calculations. And then we see on the left, because here are all the works of Bolzano which we have in our data sets, and the ones with the um, gray dots are the ones where the concept Vita occurs in. And we can sort both by year and by relevance. So here we sort it by relevance, and we see immediately that there are only four books in which he used this term. So, but we also see that there are many irrelevant results. For example, when he's discussing a certain uh, definition, and he says, no, this is too broad a definition, um, yeah, then he's using white uh, like in another sense. So that's not relevant for us. And actually, we managed to identify that there are only two books in which he um, uses the term in the, in the relevant sense, and those are his mathematical books, so that makes sense. So we can uh, filter out the irrelevant ones, because there is here this um, yeah, filter books option, so we select only the books that we are interested in. And then we find already the tenth result in the list, a very interesting result. And we go back, so from, oh, now you can't see it, but there are here some uh, buttons from which you can go from the sentence, from the search result directly to the original text. So that's what we do. And there um, we obtain immediately like the definition of vita, of width. And we say, we see that, um, so he means with with the quantity of the objects that the concept is referring to. 
that is the important thing. So again, back to the title, we now know what Viten means, but we don't know what Messen is. So we repeat uh, the same result, the same procedure, also to clarify um, what Messen means. Uh, we can do some combined searches. So for example, the concept of Messen and the title of the section to get to restrict the results even more, to make the chance higher that we get something interesting. And then we find uh, this sentence who says like, um, in the meantime, it's also true that infinite sets cannot be measured. So it seems that Bolzano held that infinite sets cannot be measured. But that is, okay. But yeah, in the, part, in the passage that we started with, it seemed that he was in, uh, measuring infinite sets. So how is that possible? So now we want to know, like, can we, according to Bolzano, measure infinite sets? So again, we make queries for, um, for sets and to measure, and for sets and to quantity. And so what we see is that in all those results, Bolzano says that you can compare infinite sets. You can say one is in some sense bigger than the other, but you cannot put a number on it. So you cannot really determine the number. But yeah, exactly. This was, that seemed at least to be what Bolzano was doing in the passage that we started out with. So now we go back to that passage, which we understand a bit better now. And we see that he is arguing here that like the first term is infinitely bigger than the second and so forth by taking every time a biggest number n, so bounding these, um, these collections from above. So in other words, like Bolzano is kind of measuring these infinite collections by making them finite. And then we go back, we now understand what he wrote in the letter to his pupil, where he says like the thing is not only presented unclearly, but also as I just began to realize entirely false. Because he continues the false result was due to an unjust inference from, from a finite sense of numbers, namely to which which do not succeed the number n to all of them. So yeah, so yeah. To to sum up, like, both it helped us like identify exactly what was the meaning um, of the letter that Bolzano wrote to his pupil. Okay. To sum up, so. Yeah, both it really uh, facilitates close reading and conceptual analysis. So yeah, philosophy is not a thing that can ever be done like completely, completely computationally. So we always will have to do um, conceptual analysis, so close reading of text. But yeah, too, like both is really facilitates that. So it enables enables us to identify very quickly which are the relevant passages. And so yeah, it does that by returning the passages. Uh, semantically similar to a given query by allowing the user to order the query results and select from them in various manners. So yeah, select out like the works if we think um, they are irrelevant. And also very importantly, uh, it allows the user to go back from the query results to the original text to see more context, to see, for example, whether an insertion was really from the philosopher itself or from the editor. And those are very important things for us. Okay. So yeah, the conclusion in general. So yeah, for our research uh, practice, like open collections are not that open. And we uh, philosophers have to ask like computer scientists, um, yeah, to solve our problems, to help us uh, get the text that we want in format that we want which is also an expensive um, solution. And so what can be done? So yeah, we, can, we would like to have much more text openly accessible, of course. Uh, also some standard uh, data format. 
and yeah, I have some data scientists think with us about how to organize all those data and things like that, because yeah, that is not our expertise, of course. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Um, the floor is yours for questions. Uh, I think it was a very complicated story, and I don't think I understood everything. But can you also make the combination of two languages, a translation from the original text that you can search for a word, and then also do that in the translated work, and then see whether it's the same? Um. So yeah, at this moment we are not uh, that far by the, by far, but yeah, I think like in the end that would be ideal indeed. Like yeah, because there's philosophy written in a lot of languages, and then yeah, if you you ideally want to obtain like as much results as possible, but yeah, I don't know I don't know the details about the feasibility of that. It seems very complicated to me. <laughs> yeah, and maybe you know more about that. And. Um, I guess that's kind of uh, the smarter way to um, to do the embedding. It can help a bit because I, there are ways to transfer the embeddings in English to other languages. You can map them together. So if that is possible, then you can search in English, get German text. That is possible, but we haven't really done so that far. Yeah. Maybe the the words are closer together than in others. I don't know. We don't look at grammar. <laughs> no. <laughs> just back. We just back of the words. But if you would have parallel text, if you would have parallel text, then uh, you can use both English or German. Doesn't matter. But as we don't have parallel text, and Google charges for each page to translate. Also a problem. <laughs> yes, about this semantic embedding. Uh, did you use any sort of ontology uh, to relate your concepts to each other? Because you, you, you talked about several concepts. You might construct an ontology first, and then you already define some relationships between those concepts. Did you do that? Well, the answer is no. Um, the, our semantic embedding was originally meant for process work at data. So we basically took a very naive uh, approach, looking at data as a bag of words. Is, if it's author, we mark it as author. Otherwise, we just pure term. We want to see whether we can develop a very scalable method to process large data, um, that which is uh, possible. We have papers published about it, and it's very competitive with other embedding methods and very efficient, like orders of magnitude, magnitudes faster. And then we talk to these philosophers. They have a very tiny data set for us to work with. But then we still, I think this, it's possible for us to still to us uh, for us to get something out of the their corpus because you do if you do the word word to vec like Google's they really rely on the huge data set to to get something out of it. So get back to your question. No, we don't do look at the the, rich, the hierarchy or ontology of philosophy, but we're just trying to see whether from a data driven point uh, yeah data driven point of view. Where, where uh, can we see something semantic relationships between the concepts we have? If I think for in the end, this is just a tool for them to help for them to find things faster, to make the full sense out of the text, they have to go back to the text for the close reading. Yeah. Yeah, I think it. What is interesting is that they started off doing using this tool and developing it for just metadata. And then they had this opportunity to also test it on full text. And I remember that they were really thrilled 
with the idea of oh now we can use our algorithm and test it there so um but it's really a very dumb it's working like a blind you know just in like this and i think it would be maybe interesting for paul your for your project for semantic clustering About the three, the three presentations, they all involve metadata mapping. Um, I, I'm not sure, but uh, if you used the original metadata from library catalogs, or if you used filtered, watered down metadata. Uh, I'm not sure, because if, if you use the original metadata, what is then the conclusion about the metadata that usually is in libraries? Is that insufficient, imprecise, etc.? So, so bearing in mind that we're uh, that, that our work is a work in progress, um, so we haven't got the final conclusions. But yes, we're using the original metadata from the library catalogs. So it was a um, direct uh, direct data dump effectively from from the various library catalogs. Um, I think. In terms of initial conclusions, I don't. I don't want to say you know final conclusions, but I think. I I, I think it's it's come up a few times that the, the, the variety of metadata standards. Um, one thing that I think was interesting for us, thinking about digitized text specifically rather than the entirety of, of the connections, was our big finding was that thinking thinking about the era. That material was digitized means that the catalog records were very different. I mean, the BL were using the example of their, the, I think, mid, mid 19th century materials were actually cataloged to the British Museum Library standards rather than any contemporary standards. And they, they have plans in house to map them to more contemporary standards, but it's not been done yet. So if, even accepting the question of how high quality the data is within a specific standard, before you even address that, you have to address the fact that the standards vary so immensely that, that it's it's difficult in the first instance. Um, but yeah, like in, in terms of other conclusions, it being, we, I mean, you, you saw from the earlier methods we used, it's, it's almost not impossible, but it's, it's, it's almost useless looking at stuff at title level, looking at string matching, which I think suggests a lot about the, the differing metadata quality of those records, that there is so much variance just in how, how a title is referred to in a library that you can't use very simple methods to, to do that work. Uh, definitely for our project, we're going back to the subject matter expert, of course, is important, but also the original metadata. So if you start with a Dublin core expression, you've already lost something. So it's a combination of both of those things, you know. So we're trying we're thinking about it from that staff perspective. How do you how do you get closer to how they originally described it, but then how do you bring their knowledge into play? And how you know how do you connect it to something that can then be machine readable? So um, it's it's sort of twofold. It's not just their knowledge, but but also going back to that original is a key improvement factor um, if if you can extract meaning from it. And I'd, I would echo that point that you just made, Shane, about going back to the experts, because one of the things we found, which again is a question of, of scalability, is is one of the most useful things we found is actually having the metadata specialists from our partner libraries in the room, so that when, he, when we come across a metadata issue, they just go, oh yes, that's because it was catalogued in British, library, British Museum Library Standards. Oh, oh yes, there's a problem with that. We know that was that was ingested. You know, they, they know they know the the history of their metadata. They know where the problems are. And they're they're able to sort of to identify those very easily rather than disappearing down sort of dead ends trying to work that out. Um, from from the purposes of our project, that's not necessarily a sustainable approach when you're talking about moving towards something global. So we need to sort of identify other methods and other ways of bringing that expertise into the into the room that don't involve a physical presence. There was one more question. 
I hope I can make myself clear uh, because I think I have two questions. <laughs> uh, is it is it possible that um, well, how does your the outcome of your project relate, for instance, to uh, a standard like Dublin Core, which is used um, quite quite globally, I must say. And uh, so that's that's first part of my question. And the second part of my question is, I'm setting up an, uh, a data model for a collection at this, right at this moment, and I recognize what you are saying that um, a lot of the fields describe we were using Dublin Core uh, in Content DM. Uh, and a lot of the fields are um, have a double meaning. For instance, format is it related to the to the uh, analog model, or is it related to the digital uh, item? Uh, are there any initiatives to uh, update Dublin Core to the um, digital area? <laughs> uh, maybe that's a beehive. <laughs> That has been a long going discussion, hasn't it? <laughs> Dublin Core. Uh, I, I can actually uh, answer to that because I'm sitting in the Dublin Core usage board. Uh, and uh, we are working on some, some minor updates, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't include this sort of stuff. So it's not, I mean, after, after the initial development, the amount of resource that the Dublin Core community has for that sort of data is quite uh, small, mm -hmm. and uh, we have some more basic issues to uh, to fix first. Besides that, the problems that you point are extremely hard. So first conceptually, and then practically. So changing the fields would require changing all the implementations that are around. Uh, so actually what we do in projects like Europeana, we encourage providers to use the most specialized versions of the properties when they, uh, they can, which may sometimes imply that they use their, their specific properties. So outside of Dublin Core, they, they declare a new property. They say, okay, this is uh, my very specific format that is unambiguous, and I declare it as a specialization of format, and you can maybe understand something. So we've got some, some cases like this. Uh, uh, and that's that's the way we uh, we handle it. But most of the time, indeed, the ambiguity uh, remains. And actually, it's it's probably the best we can do because we, I mean, we can maybe sort out the ambiguity in. I mean, coming back to your question, also in the context of the records for some libraries. But when looking at the data across different libraries or across libraries and other kind of cultural institutions, uh, then it becomes way harder to to start really uh, considering the fine grained semantics of the uh, of the record. And and the question, and that's that's maybe also a question for you, is actually do we need it? Uh, do the data consumers need it? Because actually most of the data visualization and uh, the data analysis techniques that we apply, they have already enough work to, uh, to handle uh, the basic metadata distinction and uh, to make, make sense out of, uh, out of it. So I'm not saying it's useless. So we still have some, uh, some good cases for it, but it's the motivation of it within a wider ecosystem of, of metadata aggregation and exploitation is, uh, is sometimes hard to, uh, to find. Yeah, what, what, we, what we find is uh, that there are sort of communities of interest yeah. uh, that agree on making some distinctions that can be useful. So there, there could be also metadata schemas for, for philosophy uh, that could be uh, relevant. So I've seen some projects where philosophers were annotating, uh, annotating books and they developed their own annotation schemes and there, within their context, it was highly relevant. When the data would be migrated to another environment, they did not really need uh, all the details. With the with our project about mapping to Dublin Core, uh, the simple answer is within within the context of the, the the resourcing we have that we're not. 
Um, but it kind of ties into that second part of what we're trying to do, which is not just to do those deliverables. And you know, the, the data set that we produce will, will primarily be, it's, it's not precisely confirmed we're in the process of defining exactly what that data set will look like, but it's likely to be um, a, a, a merged mark record text file. So we're not going to be doing that as part of this project, but your question is a very interesting one, I think, because it feeds into this question of what what we want that resource to do. And that's what we're scoping and the rest of it. And I think what we're moving towards within the project, so not, the, not quite answering the question other than to say where we're going, is what we're moving towards is taking that data set and using the work that we're doing with sort of community engagement with identifying potential use cases to work out what sort of use cases this could uniquely contribute to that aren't replicating other work and then looking at the data set we have in the format as far as we can take it and saying what data models do we need, what sort of what sort of mapping might, need, might we need to do, does it need to be mapped onto a different format and if we were to do that then what will that actually facilitate, what will the end product of that work be. So we don't actually have the answer to your question yet so much as have that as one of the questions that we're going to be considering as we move forward. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to invite you for lunch because it's already past one. Um, but, you know, um, I just wanted to tell you that uh, the, there will be a research report um, published on the, based on the survey data which I presented earlier on. And please follow us uh, at OCLC Research on the blog uh, hangingtogether.org. Uh, please fill in the form, the evaluation form and hand it over back to me. Thank you so much, and have a good lunch.